I want to know, do you know what technologies and patents are in there? I do. That Okay, can you share some of them with the public? I can do better than that. This would literally end all pollution on Earth, but it would also end poverty on the planet within about 20 years. This is a big announcement. I hope this goes viral because that's what we need. Their plan is to create a threat from outer space, to try to unite the world like Independence Day, the movie, in a sort of a military global junta of humans against aliens back in the 70s. So they could hit a button, basically, and stage an alien attack. What do you think about Elon Musk? And what, is he like a Nikola Tesla? Is he a good guy in your eyes? If he was inclined to research this end of it, he, he wouldn't be making a, I call it a fake Tesla. I mean, a real Tesla car wouldn't have to be plugged in. That existed in 1920s. Nikola Tesla had one. These folks, the world is the oyster. They operate as they want. Who nominates them? Nobody. It's so sensitive. We're not going to let the president control this anymore, or the Congress. Mm -hmm. The big corporate media, left, right, center, all of it is corrupt. You're convinced all of it is corrupt? Absolutely corrupt. And the proof of it is... So a couple months ago, I watched this documentary called The Lost Century. Blown away by it. First time I heard about Invention Secrecy Act of 1951. I told my wife, baby, you got to watch it. Then I told my son, you got to watch it. I told everybody, you got to watch this documentary. 6,000 patents that were protected by this senator called John Sparkman. It went into effect in 1952. Somehow, someway, that year, they chose to nominate him on the Democratic Party as the vice president November 1st, we test the biggest nuclear test at the time that was 700 times more powerful than the one we dropped in Hiroshima. November 5th was election. And then Stephen Gurry, I said, hey, man, I know we did a podcast four years ago. We got to do another one because I got a whole different thing I want to talk to you about. He came on. We had a two and a half hour conversation together. He told me about the fact that the government has access to technology to teleport. You know, teleportation we hear about in movies and sci-fi and all this stuff. Says, nah, they've had access to it for a while. Told a time about an encounter that George H.W. Bush Sr. had with President Bill Clinton, uh, telling him what to stop talking about and not even look into. A private conversation he had with Barry Goldwater. Lots of weird things. Colleagues that were killed for having information. And then today... He releases this project he's been working on for many, many years. Well, you'll have access to all these information from the Invention Secrecy Act of 1951. Anyways, I don't want to take anything away from this. Um, you will be fascinated by this conversation, especially if you are a capitalist, if you have a family and you want to find a way to preserve this great you know, world we're living in, right, Earth, and you want it to be around, and you want to find out who are the power players that are controlling all the good things that could potentially happen to you and I for the future, you're going to want to watch this thing in its entirety, and you'll thank me at the end of the podcast. Having said that, here's Dr. Stephen Greer. Did you ever think you would make it? I feel I'm so close, I could take sweet victory. I know this life meant for me. Yeah. Why would you bet on Goliath when we got bet David? Value came in, giving values contagious. This world of entrepreneurs, we get no value to hate it. Howdy run, homie, look what I become. I'm the, I'm the one. So the last time we were together, you and I, was May of 2020, which is a little over four years ago, four years and a month. Yep. And it was a fascinating conversation. Millions of people watched it. It was great. We talked about aliens. We talked about your encounters with aliens, experiences, what you've done. Mm-hmm. Obviously, a doctor, scientist, the things you've worked on. Uh, I, I even think your dad, was he working on the uh, uh, certain responsibilities with the atomic for for the government? What what, what was your dad's? Uh, no, it was my uncle helped design the lunar module. The lunar, the that's that right, your uncle. On the moon the first right, time with right. Neil Armstrong. So yeah. this is like, this is in your genes. You've been interested in this for a while. And then... Recently, I was late to this. Two months ago, uh, I watched uh, uh, The Lost Century, right? And How to Reclaim It, a documentary they did that I think came out in 2023, if I'm not mistaken, right? It came out last year. I watched it, and then I was blown away by the Invention Secrecy Act, and I went down a rabbit hole, and I wanted to find out who wrote this bill. 
Mm -hmm. And what happened to the guy that wrote the bill? The guy that wrote the bill, you know who he is, the John Sparksman, I think his name is, or something like that. You know, mm -hmm. he ends up uh, becoming the vice, the nominee for the Democratic vice presidential candidate of 1952, mm -hmm. exactly the year they wrote the bill, and they're holding on to 6,000 patents. And then I had my wife watch it. Then I had my son watch it. He's here right now. He just met you a few minutes ago. And I think the world needs to know about this. Right. And that's when I said, I think we need to do part two. And I'm glad you said yes. Happy to be here. Yeah. So here. you do a great show. So so let's let's start off with that. I mean, I got a lot of things I want to go through with you, but I want to start off with that. To the average person, when I ask them, have you heard of the Invention Secrecy Act? When I tell you 99% say I've never heard of it, I'm being friendly. Right. Because... 100% people are like, what is the Invention Secrecy Act of 1951? Can you tell the audience what is the Invention Secrecy Act of 1951, who was behind it, and why? Well, it actually became a, a, an offshoot of the projects from the 40s uh, dealing with energy and technology and propulsion systems that, if they were disclosed, would be a, the immediate replacement of oil, gas, coal, surface transportation, public utilities, well, in today's dollars, you're talking probably over a thousand trillion dollars. So, uh, what most people don't realize is that around between 1945 and 1954 was the heyday of electromagnetic engineering, dealing with energy and propulsion, and it was from two sources: uh, research that had been done in the late 1800s and early 20th century. And even things that people call anti-gravity, not the correct scientific term, but let's just go with that. It's really gravity control. Um, those experiments started in the late 20s with T. Townsend Brown and the Kolosky Frost experiment in Germany. And where very high voltage systems would cause objects to lift and basically have mass cancellation and look like they're defying gravity. And levitate. This is the G engines you're talking yep. about. Yep. And the, but that was earlier. I mean, that was later. This was 20s. But those began to be more and more classified. So T. Towns and Brown's work became some of the core founding for what's called the Rand Corporation in Ventura, California. But those got populated with the research from retrieving uh, extraterrestrial vehicles in the for, mid 40s and 50s where they began to study them under a very highly classified project. I have the documents. We've just released all of them to the public last month in our Disclosure Project Intelligence mm -hmm, Archive. Mm -hmm. But it describes, in, in one of the Canadian top secret documents, that a top secret team was working on this in 1950, and the work they were doing surpassed the secrecy of the development of the hydrogen bomb, the ultimate doomsday weapon, if you can imagine. Now, this is an authenticated top secret you know, uh, document. So the, the, the punchline on that is there was this technological breakthroughs, both human and in studying objects from outer space, let's say, that came together, the like two mighty rivers that became this torrent, but very classified. So they realized that there were too many people stumbling across this, and they created this act to so give the government the power that even if you don't apply for a patent, if they learn you have something that they want to seize, all they have to do is issue a national security order on it, and they take it. And this is not a conspiracy theory and all that. It's just a fact. You can look up the, you know, people can look this up. Um, and I am working, I've worked over the years with many, many people who've had that happen to them, uh, geniuses that have had their work confiscated. Um, and it would be an enormous benefit to humanity. But the super elite, global elite, don't want that out. They don't want. They didn't want it out in the 50s, and they don't want it out now. So that is the core of the secrecy behind what people call UFOs or UAPs. That, I mean, that's really the, the, the heart of it. The other thing is that when I go into a SCIF, a secure compartment information facility where top secret information is exchanged, the, one of the first things I do, whether it's with the members of Congress or some military people, uh, is to, you know, tell them, you know, see this video that the Pentagon has confirmed is real of this UFO flying off the coast of California. And uh, they got released a few years ago. And I said, just look at that. Forget all the esoteric and alien cachet and baggage. That is an alternative energy and propulsion device, period. And I said, if you look at how it's moving and the, the sensors that they put on that thing, uh, both from space and the ship, 
the, the, the big uh, battleship out there and the jet pilots uh, flying those F-18s, they had no heat signature. You know, and, and, and Pat, that, here's the thing. There's no jets. There's no rockets. And if it was a, a nuclear power plant, it would be very hot because, you know, fission is extremely hot. So how is it doing? How is it moving like that? Well, it's using this whole new physics. And uh, this is why most of our uh, Air Force and, and other pilots, when they encounter these, they immediately assume all of them are alien or extraterrestrial. When in reality, I'd say 70, 80 percent of them are ours. Highly classified, illegally run covert programs uh, without the oversight of the Congress and the president. So that secrecy has become so embedded. You know, Eisenhower had a pretty good clue about it when he left office and he said, but where the military industrial complex? And I remember where I mind people, he's a five star general, right? And a conservative Republican, moderate Republican back then. But he he was no enemy of the military. But he warned the dangers to democracy and secrecy because of this. Now, he didn't mention the UFO issue, but he was very much read in, and I can prove that. Our archive goes through that. And he then, by 1957 to 8, was being pushed aside out of those programs. And we actually have an attorney who at the time was a young man in the Army. His testimony we released in this archive where he says he was at the White House Signal Corps, in 19, you know, 59, 60, before Eisenhower left. And Eisenhower told him that he was being blocked control over these projects. So these covert programs have been, let's just say, off the leash for most of, you know, the, 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 the last 60 so years. So I, I want to ask you this. So the, I'm going through timeline while you're talking, and I'm taking mm-hmm. notes here, you know. Sure. So Hiroshima happened August 6, 1945. Right. Okay. Nagasaki happened August 9th, 1945. Mm-hmm. Okay. Invention Secrecy Act happened in 1951, which ended up being a law, 1952, right. led by Senator John Sparksman. Mm-hmm. Great. And that year, he ends up being nominated as the vice president for the Democratic, you know, right. uh, nominee. Okay. Then the election that year, that the day we voted on Tuesday was November 4th right. of 1952. Two. Yeah. Three days prior to that, on November 1st of 1952, is the big explosion that we had, the thermonuclear explosion uh, that took place. Rob, if you can pull this up, um, type in hydrogen bomb year. Just type in hydrogen bomb year, Okay. So if you type in hydrogen, can you zoom in? That I just want to read that right there. The U.S. tested the first full-scale thermonuclear device on November 1st of 1952. Mm-hmm. The result was an explosion that was equivalent to one of them, one uh, produced by more than 10 million tons of TNT. Mm-hmm. This was approximately 700 times the power of the uranium bomb dropped in Hiroshima. Stephen, 700. So, mm-hmm. so here's what I'm trying to find out. Mm-hmm. The, t- the time span from... August 6th, Hiroshima, August 9th, Nagasaki, uh, uh, you know, Invention of Secrecy Act of 1951, Mm -hmm. 52 becomes in, then November 1st, we have the hydrogen bomb, November uh, 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 4th is the election, is the reason why they put the Invention of Secrecy Act a noble cause, or was it the fact that people of big industries were afraid that maybe they're about to lose some of their control and business that they have. Because there's a part of it that could be like, no, it was noble. We were worried. We wanted to make sure that certain things wouldn't be available to other people because if they did, what if out there in the free marketplace somebody explodes and messes with this uranium and then all of a sudden we lose, the, you know, we lose our country, we lose all this stuff. How much do you think was noble? How much of you think it was, hey, you pass this bill, we'll make you the vice president, we can do this. What do you think happened there? I think it's both. I, I think for certain... The uh, there there are certain valid national security secrets that are technological that that should be kept that way and and uh, you know, and I and I don't, have, I don't have a grievance with that. What what's terrible is when there are uh, corrupting influences from financial and corporate sectors uh, that then it's the tail wagging the dog of the government of we the people. Right. And, you know, so my great, great, whatever grandfather was the first prisoner of war in the American Revolution. And, you know, uh, my family, my dad was hand to hand combat World War II in, in the Pacific. You know, we look at this. I mean, the people I work with who are special forces and military and they look at this and they go, well, 
you know, if you have a corrupting influence and you have that kind of state power, then you, you can get into trouble if there isn't proper oversight. And there hasn't been. What I'm trying to say is that between the 50s and now, after Eisenhower got shoved aside, the folks who have been working and keeping these uh, secrets are not necessarily doing it on behalf of, of the U.S. government or the American people or the world. They're doing it on behalf of their own interests, which are usually financial and uh, global power related. And that is the problem. It's, it's a big problem when no one's minding the store. This is why I've been trying to get Congress uh, to have um, subpoena power through the House Oversight Committee and the members of Congress I'm, I've been meeting with, uh, which we'll get into that. That's just been blocked, by the way. Um, because without that, you know, you, you really have a, a Frankenstein we created in secrecy that Eisenhower warned us about that's, that's really gone crazy. So, yes, there are some valid national security secrets that would be covered by that. But on the other hand, it, it's, a, it, it's like your grandmother's skirt. It hides everything, right? And, 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 and they can hoover up it's totally legitimate technologies that, for example, you could have an electric car but not have 900 pounds of lithium-ion batteries. You'd have a battery about this big. And it would start up a electromagnetic generator pulling energy out of, we can talk about this, what's called the quantum vacuum or zero point energy field. And you'd never have to plug the thing in, right? So that- That was in there at that time? That existed in 1920s. Nikola Tesla had one. And we've documented this. Now, remember, when Nikola Tesla died in 1943, the FBI went in and seized, uh, I think it was- uh, 40-some uh, trunks, or, uh, or no, it was 20-some trunks of secret papers. And uh, I have a group that's thinking of suing for those. But those... Who still has that? The U.S. government has that, or the militant industrial complex has that? We like, don't... We, this is a good question. Because where does this stuff go once it gets hoovered up under the Secrecy Act? And this is a big problem, because you would think, let's make this real for people, right? So back going 30... Uh, well, 1993, it's uh, 31 years. I was asked as a young doctor to come up and brief the director of the CIA for Bill Clinton and uh, our James Woolsey. Um, and it's because he and the president had started looking into this issue, the whole UFO issue, all of it. And they had been denied access and blocked and were being lied to. You're in the room with both of them. I'm in the room with the CIA director. Okay. And my POC, my point of contact to him, who is the head of a military think tank. Um, so I thought, honestly, I mean, you put me under the sodium pentothal. I thought it was a ruse to pick my brain because I had these aerospace connections in my family. I had all this information. And it was just counterintelligence trying to figure out what I knew. No, it turned out the CIA director was completely blocked. The president had been blocked. And then I found out recently Clinton was threatened. And I have a document that also establishes that from someone who was with him, where he admitted that he was personally threatened if he looked into this much further. And uh, so I think this, you know, was my coming of age. To be honest with you, uh, I was always interested in UFO and ET issue. I'd had sightings when I was younger, had a family member who designed a thing that landed on the moon with Neil Armstrong. And yes, we did go. They just didn't tell us everything that happened. But the... Uh, the CIA director was shaken, and he couldn't get access, even with the clearance that a director of CIA would have. So there's a parallel illegal black government system that I think is mostly corporate. So if you're asking me where the center of power on this is, you know, everyone in Congress and the National Security Council and the president wouldn't add up to anything, a hill of beans compared to what Lockheed Skunk Works and my uncle Northrop Grumman, he had his whole career with Northrop Grumman, Raytheon, and some of these other uh, huge behemoths that are contractors, but who have highly compartmented operations dealing with this. Now, we actually have the information and a letter from the director, the head of the Lockheed Skunk Works, the top secret aerospace engineering and it's in the archive. We release this now, both the letter written to him from a friend that his widow gave to us and the reply from Ben Rich. And it says point blank, his friend said, do we have these UFOs? And he says, yes, some are extraterrestrial. 
Many are ours. And he admits they're ours, meaning human made. So people think that technology stands still. But if you if you're at the threshold in the 20s, 30s, 40s, discovering this area of science of electromagnetic physics, post quantum sort of entanglement, we can get into this. It's sort of boring for the general public. But and then you know you have special access projects that are top secret, but then decide. It's so sensitive, we're not going to let the president control this anymore or the Congress, mm. except for a few devils that they put in there that, that, that do control it. So it's a complicated sort of architecture of this secrecy. You have to throw your civics, high school civics book in the trash. So let, let, me, let me go back to this. Still, I'm stuck on this Invention Secrecy Act from purely sure. a capitalistic standpoint, not even the alien <laughs> side and all the mm-hmm. other stuff right. that's in there, right? So let's go back to it. So y- y- enough energy to, you know, zero point energy, which we'll mm-hmm. get into. Okay, great. And this Nikola Tesla and what happened to him and they came and they took the files, God knows how many boxes, and they went to Trump's uh, uncle, his, Fred Trump's uh, brother, John. They go to him. Hey, is this anything that's a threat if it's leaked to the public? No, nothing to worry about. Great. They still end up keeping it anyways, right? Mm-hmm. And, but I'm trying to find out. So if you were to simplify to the audience, the audience wants to know, hey, Stephen, what, what are some of those 6,000 6, patents that we have mm-hmm. and what industries would they destroy and how, how much would our lives improve? For example, you know, one, uh, we have access to being able to produce cars that can run on water and it puts out of a $5 trillion, it puts a $5 trillion oil industry out of business overnight. Right. You know, we have the, you know, uh, uh, pharmaceutical side to be able to come up and, you know, solve Cancer tonight, you know, we just have because if we do the amount of chemotherapy business as a such and such amount of mm-hmm. billion dollar industry, we don't want to put that out of this. Mm-hmm. We have the ability to do it. I want to know, do you know what uh, uh, technologies and patents are in there? I do. That Okay. Can you share some of them with the mm-hmm. public that, you know, maybe would mm-hmm. be revealing? I, well, I, I can do better than that. You go to our archive and there's a whole file of, uh, I believe, thousands of pages of those that were copied by a man I knew who's passed away named John Benini. And there was a CIA officer who had approached me, but previously had approached him, and took him. And it's called the Sejeki Files, uh, S-E-G-E-K-I, Sejeki. And he was a CIA officer who allowed uh, Mr. Benini to go into a... Bedini or Benini? Bedini, B-E-D-I-N-I. Got it. Uh, John Bedini, and he's passed away uh, but uh, a couple years ago. But this uh, CIA officer, Sajaki, um, he let him go into a facility where they had confiscated these sort of inventions over many decades. And, and they had the patents in file cabinets. And he told John Bedini, he said... You know, he was trying to recruit him into the agency in a covert program dealing with technologies because the guy was a genius with electromagnetic engineering, uh, Benini was. And and he let him for 24 hours copy anything he wanted. And so he went and he did. But the CIA officer, uh, Sajaki, uh, eventually was told, no, I'm not going to join your operation. But Benini had kept a copy of those files which uh, members of my team digitized. So the CIA first didn't know he, that he took those files. He didn't know he kept a copy. He thought he got them all back. And now we've released them. We, they, they were in an encrypted uh, uh, CD, I believe. And they're in, under, the, the encryption's been removed and people can go in there. Now, now that was the tip of the iceberg because, I mean, this, this was a huge facility. It's like the end of the movie, uh, where the, you know, it is Steven Spielberg and the Raiders of the Lost Ark when they're rolling the thing this, mm-hmm. you know, into this big warehouse top. Where was this facility? It was in the upper Midwest, is what I've, I've been asked just to say. In, in an old school house facility that was cordoned off and looked like nothing important. So you know where it's at, but just you're not able to say. Yep. Okay. I do know where it is. Got it. And would it be a place that the average person walks by every day and they have no clue what it is? They'd have no idea. And is there protection, like hardcore secret you know, protection around it that you can't see? Or are there people outside of the building that you could tell that something's weird about this building? There are sensors. There are sensors. Got right, it. Right. And what are some of the things you guys found, you know, thousands of pages? What, what are some things your team and your, uh, you, you, you and your team found where it's, why would they hide something like this from? Why would they keep this away from us? 
Well, they had, they, they had electromagnetic devices that were so-called free energy. Um, they had uh, technologies that would take water, as you mentioned, and do the hydrolysis uh, past the Faraday constant, where it would be at certain voltages and frequency, you get a magnetically charged hydrogen and oxygen gas you can burn, get energy. The only pollution is water vapor. You know, all of those sort of uh, technologies. But then there were other things that were even stranger, um, where you, you can cause uh, basically atomic uh, changes in the electron shell so that you can move up and down the periodic table at certain uh, frequencies, magnetic field frequencies, um, so that you could it's, theoretically take tin and turn it into gold. It's transmutation. It's like the alchemist, but, the, but it's high tech. And these are very old discoveries. And so one of the big problems is when you ask this question, why wouldn't we have it, the, the, the economic power is really about you know the money, it's about dollars. But when you start talking about trillions and dozens or hundreds of trillions of dollars, now you're talking about something that is an impact that's way beyond you know inventing a cell phone or even the internet. It, it, this is way past that because our entire planet is running on an antiquated grid and, and energy paradigm from the late 1800s. And if you take a nuclear power plants, the mid 40s. And what I remind people is, do you really think fundamental energy uh, generation and, and propulsion technologies haven't gone forward since 1945? Uh, this is ridiculous. Um, and uh, But those technologies, which prompted these national security patent acts and seizure laws, uh, both had applications. They could be sold to Congress because there were legitimate state secrets. You didn't want to just let someone leak out, you know, your uh, design for a nuclear warhead, for example. But on the other hand, there are things that would, uh, technologies that would greatly benefit humanity. And, and, and let me remind people, this would literally end all pollution on Earth, but would also end poverty on the planet within about 20 years. Why? Right now, you have 3 billion people on the planet. Uh, the Economist came out with an article, I think two years ago, about this that don't even have energy to cook their food. So they're like cutting down any brush in the desert and the rainforest just to be able to have some charcoal to cook food. That's 3,000 million people. This isn't sustainable. This is not a way to have a planet, right? So these technologies would change that. And many, many people in these covert programs agree this should change. But you're stepping on some very big toes. I mean, you're talking the kind of macroeconomic power globally that is way past anything that the president deals with. And, okay. and that's the problem. Because on the one hand, it's, 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 some people have told me who are in this system, it's like the, the cure is worse than the disease. That to release this, it'd be too disruptive. I said, yes, it should have been released 100 years ago. It would have been transition, would have been easy. But now look at the mess we're in. Because of this secrecy, but also the illegal application of it in the last 60 years. Now, that is what Congress right now is trying to grapple with. But it's a big mistake for the public to think because you're the chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee um, or the co-chairman. Like, you're a nobody. Like Mr. Other... Rubio. Yeah. Those folks are told either nothing or some version of a lie that they want to be told. This is what happened to Mr. Trump, by the way, in his first term. And... Um, and also Mr. Pence, um, because a, a friend of Mr. Pence's family is, works with me, and, and, and we found out what happened. But the, the, the problem with all of this is what has happened to democracy and oversight and the, the, we the people. But also, if it, you know, when you talk about we have a, a free market economy and capitalism, do we? I mean, if the most important discoveries and sciences of the last hundred years have been ruthlessly confiscated and kept secret, no, we have a faint shadow. We have a managed economy. You know, it's not quite as managed as, say, uh, China's or the Soviet Union's or Venezuela and controlled, but it's still controlled and managed. It's a mistake to think it's free, uh, free market. It isn't. Um, the only way it could be free is that if the technologies that were not weaponized, and this is when you mentioned that 
you know, uh, Mr. Trump's uncle, said, no, these are fine. They're not going to hurt anything. Uh, well, they wouldn't hurt. It's not like they're dangerous. It's just that it's going to hurt you if you own, you know, a $3 trillion oil field uh, off of Venezuela or whatever uh, and these big interests. So I think this is, you know, and, and I'm not saying that everybody in the oil industry knows about this. They're not. They're just doing their jobs. But I'll tell you, there's a Fortune 50, Fortune 500, Fortune 50 companies chairperson trying to come forward. And Fortune 50 chairperson that's trying to come forward? Yeah, chairman, former chairman. He, you, he's getting up there. He's about 79 or 80. He's still active? Oh, former chairman. But, and, he, but he has the documents and the information. He wants to come forward with them. But, you know, when he reached out to me last year, they threatened him and his family and his grandchildren. Is he a money guy? Does and, he have, uh, Is he financially free? Oh, sure. I mean, my so, God. so how do they threaten them? What do they say? How do you threaten a person like that? What are we yeah. going to do to you? No, they kill your whole family. No, who, 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 who? So, who calls a person like that? Really spooky people. I've had them appear in my life and threaten me. I say, buzz off. But, uh, but you know, we we've had I've had four people on my team killed. Four people in your team yeah, killed. I have. And you know, you when, when when Mr. Grush was asked about this at the. House Oversight hearing last year, he said yes. And because when, when Mr. Grush was working with people that I had been briefing to give information so he could begin to drill down on this. and But he was not a direct whistleblower witness. He was actually, he's called a whistleblower, but he's not. He didn't directly deal with the technology or the programs. He was investigating them on behalf of the folks that that I was given information to to tell them where to go. Like I told them exactly where to go in the high desert of California to find this stuff or, you know, wherever. So, but, you know, it, it, someone asked, I, one of the members of the committee, I think it was uh, Congressman Burchett, who, who I've been working with, asked, well, have people been killed? And, of course, a few months earlier, I think it was January of last year, there was a peripheral person on that team who was killed because he stuck his nose in the wrong place. So people are very naive, frankly, if they don't think this kind of corrupt power. You know, th think of the worst thing you've ever heard about the mafia or the mob on steroids, hypercharged on steroids. But, let, but let's, stay, let's stay on that. that, that that's what you're dealing with. Here. So They're thugs. Four people that were killed Sorry. on your team, they're public. Uh, uh, but like, what, how were they killed and how recent was it? Oh, this goes back in the 90s. Uh, what were you talking about when that, you know, what were they talking about or digging that cost them their lives? They were deep cover sources giving me information. So and, they were, they had jobs. Before I had good security in place. And I didn't have what I have in place now, which I call. Can you say what they did for a living or no? Uh, oh, well, there were various. Well, one was a military naval intelligence guy. One was CIA. Uh, and one was an assistant of mine. It was an assistant of yours. I'm a good friend. How did he get killed? She. How did yeah. she get killed? Uh, it was basically a chemical weapon uh, that was induced a very aggressive cancer very quickly. And, you know, I, I have an FBI uh, lady on my team who's a special agent. She said, oh, we have 150 substances like that. 150 substances to inject cancer into somebody? Or brush up against someone or do something that will kill them. Yeah. I mean, brush up against somebody like there was a movie I watched about the brushing up to somebody that. Oh, absolutely. So that's not just a movie. In real life, no. they can do that as oh, well. Oh, 100 percent. OK, so let, let's go back to this. So this this is but, but let, let's go back to, to the point I'm making. And that is people are afraid and they, they should be. Now, this is why I mean, going back to 94, I asked the president at the time, Clinton, to do an executive order protecting high value whistleblowers and witnesses who were the corporate or government military CIA. And, and no one would do it. I have a big announcement. So I'm saying this on your show now because it starts uh, June 20th. Uh, there is a special access project that has been stood up that is going to provide this kind of security and protection to whistleblowers and high-value witnesses that have been sitting on the fence coming forward. This is a big announcement. I hope this goes viral because that's what we need. Now, I asked the Congress to put that in a bill, 
but they're not quite at the point where they realize lethal force has been used. They're still a little bit naive. And so uh, since lethal force has been authorized, uh, in fact, not long ago, there was a meeting in a skiff talking about engaging the wet works. Wet works is a term for assassinations. Um, it used to be an old Soviet term, wet from blood. But, uh, but those sort of operations is, is not some kind of movie. You know, it's real. I've dealt with it. And, you know, this, this chairman of this huge, uh, former chairman of this big uh, Fortune 50 corporation, he desperately, he, he regrets what he did. You know, and, and he has stated to us that the whole world decades ago could have had quote unquote free energy with these technologies. And look at the state it's in. So let, let me so ask. He, he really wants to come forward, but he's scared. So I'm saying, look, I'm going to just try to set this up. I see what you're saying. So this is a big announcement that there's, uh, I can't say what agency it's under, but it is an authorized special access project that can monitor security and provide security. And to whistleblowers. To whistleblowers, yes, and, and, and witnesses, people who have been in these projects, seen things that want to come forward, or they may have documents like this uh, gentleman. Is this an agency that has a lot of credibility today? I don't think any government agency in the United States has a lot of credibility today. Is no. this a three-letter agency that we're familiar with? It would certainly be known by any educated American, but I can't comment beyond that. Um, but I will say that the people in it are all folks who had been in um, special forces, and have, and they are not in the military now because you can't do that. Of course, you're, you know, military can't act uh, domestically. But um, and and they're wonderful people, and so uh, I've been working with these folks for a while, providing them an unredacted version of the archive we just released, meaning unredacted, it has all the names. It has 760-some whistleblowers in it. Um, now, you know, if you go to the, the archive, you'll see, I think we have 120-some whistleblowers and witnesses, name, rank, serial number, and their video testimony. Not one or two, not five. So what's in this archive, if, if the Congress held hearings starting next week, from Monday through Friday, 9 to 5, these are the names, May 13, 2024? Yeah, look at this. Yeah, it's 700 and some. But the first 100 and some are people we've already interviewed. We have their DD-214s, discharge forms. We have video, most of them on video testimony. Are these all public? Man, it's all public. Anyone with a computer on planet Earth can see these. Can they see the videos or that's being released? Both. Is it already released? Yes, sir. Okay. And what's the website that they can go to? Uh, this, well, we have to put that up. I, this is a, a DP, like Disclosure Project Intelligence Archive. It's DPI Archive. DPI A. Yeah. DPIA. Archive. Oh, well, archive. Yeah. We'll put so, the link below. We have it right is, there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we just released this last week. And of course, we had about thousands of bots that invaded the site, tried to shut it down. Um, so we are asking people to, to register. It's free. Um, we have a crowdfunding program because it's probably going to cost us. I don't know, tens of thousands of dollars a month in usage fees. But the reason I did this, and I've never done this, <laughs> if you want to hear an interesting backstory of how accidents happen, weird, you know, like, why would I do something like this? And this is all stuff out of my own archive, 34 years of accumulated information. And in it also is the black site list, 150 some black sites, where they are, and also links to testimony from witnesses about what's there underground in deep underground military bases or SCIFs, Secure Compartment Information Facilities. So some of them people have heard of, like Nellis Air Force Base and Edwards. Some people, no, most people never heard of. Black sites. Mm -hmm. uh, CIA controls black sites used by the U.S. government in its war on terror to detain people deemed to be enemy combatants. Well, not that. Not, that's what well, we have various th sites, but I'm talking about where retrieved UFOs have come, been put, where reverse engineered objects are located, okay. where the man made ones are. When we knock one down with an electromagnetic or weapon, a directional energy weapon, where are those taken? Where have they been studied? All that's in the archive. So, so, so it, it's a massive data dump. Let, let, me, let me go through a couple things here. So, mm -hmm. one, uh, this chairman of a fortune, former chairman of a fo fortune 50 company. Mm -hmm. Great guy. If 
if any of these, if these 6,000 patents were to be released, and right now, if I'm not mistaken, the punishment is that they give you 75% of what they think the patent is worth. I believe that's what they say. And then if you sell it off to somebody else and they find out you're going to jail for the rest of your life, right. if you even talk about it, you're going to jail for the rest of your life. Right. And if you go on Invention Secrecy Act of 1951, the way they categorize mm -hmm. On what goes in there, right there, if you can read it, folks, the Invention Secrecy Act allows the U.S. government to classify ideas and patents under secrecy <laughs> orders, which definitely restrict public knowledge of them. And at the top, if you read it, the United States federal law designed to prevent disclosure of new inve investigations, the opinion and technologies that in the opinion of selected federal agencies, so it's purely opinion based. Of selected federal agencies present an alleged threat, it's alleged threat, mm -hmm. to the economic stability and national security of the United States. Okay, so energy oil, let's just go through it. ExxonMobil right now, market cap, June 2024 is $497 billion, half a trillion dollar company. Chevron is 284, Petro China 244, but that's China. India, UK, set them aside. You got a few other companies, you got BP, $100 billion companies. These are not small companies we're talking about. Shell 218, right? Uh, I can go through a bunch of these that we know about. Um, if if these things were released, how long before these industries were wiped out? Or would it be nasty? Would it be ugly? Would it be a danger to society? Would people be doing, you would, would protesting riots, ugliness, power players coming and saying, you're touching my wealth, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. What, what would happen if this actually was to be released? Well, see, this is the tragedy of corrupt interests keeping good science away from the public for over 100 years. Yes, it's going to be very difficult. It's like an addiction. Uh, the, the current energy paradigm, the whole planet is now addicted to substances that are not only cancer-causing and bad for the environment, but costly, and that leaves, as I mentioned, 3 billion people with no means even to cook their food. So that paradigm should have been retired, but we can't help that. We have to take the fact this is 2024. And so what I have always said is that it has to be released and then transition. But keep in mind, let's take one example, since you're getting into the macroeconomics of this. We make on the planet about 100 million motor vehicles a year. Mm -hmm. But there are one and a half billion motor vehicles on the road, uh -huh. cars and trucks. So even if you retooled and twinkled your nose like bewitched or something and retrofitted all vehicle manufacturing to these systems, it would take about 15 years. And to tool up, it'll be five. So you're talking 20 years. Now, I'll probably be dead because I turn 69 this week, next week. And, you know, your children will be in college. And so even if we did it immediately, because there's a lag time, because we're not talking about, you know, downloading an app. We're talking about heavy industry here. We're talking about public utilities. We're talking about manufacturing a box that would be at your house that would generate all the energy you need for your home, no, bill, no power bill, and no pollution. But to retrofit 3 billion households on the planet, 2.5 billion, this is a massive. I mean, this makes the Marshall Plan after World War II look like nothing. So, yes, this is why I've been saying the policymakers, this needs to happen. It will happen. But the longer, this is like a leak in your roof, right? The longer you put that off, the harder and the mess is going to be to clean up and the more damage. So this is the tragedy of it is that this was allowed to go on. And one of the things I've observed, people in, in periods of enormous power and responsibility, when they realize, w w when I go into a facility and I say, see that thing? That's an alternative energy and propulsion device, what people call a UFO. Well, once they realize what these implications are, then they get scared. They get to the edge of the table or the edge of the cliff and back off. So here we are. Now, I've spent 34 years trying to resolve this problem, uh, literally 50% of my biological life. Uh, and it's a very heavy lift and a very dangerous lift. But, you know, what are we going to leave to our children, your children? My gra I have 12 grandchildren. You know, what are we leaving, you know, uh, on this planet to them? And I think beyond that, there's even a bigger issue not being addressed. 
some of these UFOs or UAPs are from extraterrestrial origin. None of them are hostile, but we have been targeting them with electromagnetic directional energy weapons since the 40s. And those technologies have become more and more sophisticated. And, you know, they have not struck back. If they did, the whole planet would come to a standstill because I think they're fundamentally peaceful and very highly developed socially and spiritually. However, how do we know that? Well, because there have been a lot of people who've had contact and there's no evidence otherwise. Now, there are some scary stories, what we call the stagecraft of, um, you know, so-called abductions and mutilations and things like that. But those are all done by covert human programs. It's, um, those are lookalikes. Uh, we can get into that. I mean, that's a whole, actually, there's a whole section of the archive on that. And we actually document this. I have top secret guys who come forward on the record stating point blank that they have been part of operations abducting people. And in fact, the very famous uh, 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 astrophysicist, uh, Dr. Jacques Vallée, who uh, some of his work ended up in Steven Spielberg's movie, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. And uh, he's up in his 80s now. And in 1992, he wrote, in a, he wrote a book and he had a log entry where he had received a 1985 CIA document that outlined uh, for psychological warfare purposes, them using these advanced technologies that look like an alien craft and other technologies to, quote, abduct peasants in Argentina and Brazil for their psychological warfare value. Now, that's in black and white. And so people go, this sounds crazier than the myth you've been told, and it is. But why would they do that? Verna von Braun in his deathbed in 1974 told a member of my team, Carol Rosen, that their plan is to create eventually an hoax, a threat from outer space, to try to unite the world like Independence Day, the movie, in a sort of a military global junta of humans against aliens. It's all nonsense. It's BS. But it sells well. It sells movies. It sells tickets. It sells books. This is the Blue Beam, Project Blue Beam? Yeah, that related to that. And, and I've met with many men who've been on op operationally, like literally have been operational on those programs. Um, now, it went from really clunky stuff, like the Betty and Barney Hill abduction. People think that was alien. It wasn't. It was us. Um, late 50s, early 60s. And... I think President Obama's actually working on a documentary about that. And uh, it was an interracial couple, a very interesting story. But most people have no idea what really happened with that. And this is one of the really disturbing parts of this archive, is what are the technologies that are in the hands of these sort of monsters? And how have they used it to deceive the public, but also deceive policymakers and presidents? You know, I, I talked to a man named Colonel Holman, H-O-L-M-A-N. He, he, he passed away, and this was maybe five years ago. And he was on a committee trying to sell first Carter, who wouldn't bite, and then President Reagan on SDI, Star Wars, the Strategic Defense Initiative. And they weren't biting. And then he said, what we did, we eventually played the alien threat card. And that's when Reagan signed on to it. Now, he was prepared to do so because I'm working with a, an older CIA officer with a PhD. Uh, that some of his information is in the archive, but his name's redacted because we still work together. And he actually uh, was a postdoc, had a PhD, and, and briefed uh, candidate Ronald Reagan in 1979 when he was thinking of running for president on the UFO issue. Because Reagan had had a couple sightings, including one on the governor's plane that you may have heard about. Uh, it, it's well documented. And so, you know, President Reagan not – here's one of the problems of, of the president. You, you get into a position and say you're a governor or you're a real estate developer like Mr. Trump, whatever you are. Or, you know, Mr. Carter was – he said he was a peanut farmer. He was actually a nuclear engineer. And the top of his class in, in Annapolis, very smart, probably our highest IQ president. It, politically, not very good, but he he was very very smart. But uh, and and you're going to come in there, and the people who are going to come in and brief you on this, if you ask, you're either going to be told nothing, and I know this because I've dealt with it pretty much every bit of presidential involvement since uh, 19, uh, 
since Clinton. You're either going to be told nothing or you're going to be told a version of the truth that manipulates you into decisions they want to make, they want you to make. And that's what happened to Mr. Trump and, and, and Mr. Pence and also to Ronald Reagan. So um, it's dangerous. See, that kind of secrecy, let me t- tell you why it's so dangerous. It's the foxes and there's manning the hen house. You know, who's overseeing this, right? Who's looking into this and who is in charge? Well, it certainly isn't the president. They come and go every four to eight years. Members of Congress come and go all the time. So there's sort of this permanent committee a few hundred people, and they have arrogated this because it's so secret, the right to do this. But they cannot be trusted. Who do they report to? Themselves. I mean, this is a this is a global operation. And by the way, what so I'm— a global operation, so from different oh, countries. Oh, 100 percent. No, it, it take the map of the world and erase yeah. all the geopolitical lines. Uh, it doesn't matter. And that's actually— when the Senate intelligence people wanted me to come in, there was a, a, a map of the world in the conference room in the skiff. And I said, see that map erased all the lines on it. This is, these folks, the world is their oyster, they operate as they want. Who nominates them? Nobody. They move up through the chain of command or through corporations. How do you move up? You're moved up by giving a little information, see what you do with it. Um, and if you can keep the secrecy, but more importantly, once you reach a certain level of clearance, when and you realize how monstrous and criminal the operations are, will you stay with that? Uh, I'm dealing with a team right now that I can't see. I won't even say what state they're in. But let's just say in September, I was on a classified helicopter over two black sites and was shown where the underground openings are out in the desert, where the man-made ones come up and are tested. But there are also electromagnetic pulse weapons that are illegal by the nuclear uh, non-proliferation treaty that are, and I have video and photos of this. One of the photos is in the archive. I'll just tell you that. And there looks like there's a landing strip. It's not. It's an area with diamonds on it, and that's where the man-made, some people call them ARVs, alien reproduction vehicles, come up from underground, and I have the photos and video of the underground opening. We went right around it because this guy was cleared. He's one of the top people in the system, but he's wanting to defect. His, and it's one of these uh, hundred people, one of these couple hundred people? He's very high up. I wouldn't say he's on that policy level, but operationally, he's read in. He's been read in for many, many, many years, and he's very high up. What's his reason? And so what did, you went there and you actually saw it? Yeah, videotape. I have all of it. And it's public? Some of it. Off the air, I'll show you the video. Of okay. It. Mm-hmm. And so that in September, and then, of course, I was almost killed in October. I think I mentioned that to you. How'd you, get, how'd you get almost killed in October? Oh, someone tampered with my mountain bike seat, and it snapped off, and I was going fast. And my left foot came off, and two bones were in the air, and my left shoulder came off. And my abdomen got right. I had four surgeries in three months. You've got to be kidding me. Yeah, I'm up doing everything now, but it was hell on earth. But, you know... <laughs> You know, it's not the first. And how do you know it was tampered with? How do you know somebody? Well, I mean, it, it wasn't the the bike that, it, it was like the whole thing just was kind of sawed through and snapped off. We can't prove anything. I, I'm, you know, who cares? I mean, you know, I, as an emergency doctor, you know, I'm a trauma doctor anyway. Ironically, I'm laying there going, it's like an out-of-body experience seeing me there with my foot off and the bones in the air. But, but I go, you know, I, the only thing I said, I'm effed. You know, it was mm-hmm. like, that's the only mm-hmm. thing I said. But, you know, it was a full trauma. How, how, how much do you, are you, because you're in this world, uh, <laughs> who do you trust? Like what, mm-hmm. what uh, how do you process who you can trust and mm-hmm. who you can't trust? Mm-hmm. Oh, it's like the things, <laughs> it was in the Bible, ye shall know them by their deeds. So, well, my wife, my close circle of friends I've had for 50, 60 years, um, uh, my assistant who, who's been with me for a quarter of a century and other people and you know, now there's this whole team of, uh, you know, special forces folks and people who are defecting that I uh, uh, are very close and who are enormously courageous men who want to do the right thing for the world and for the country. Um, you know, Green Berets and Navy SEALs, some of them. But these are, some of them are still very active. Some have separated from the military and are working in private. But they're all gathering to do 
this disclosure of the subject. And then th what I just mentioned, the gentleman who had me on the chopper over these black sites in September, there's a whole team that he is involved with at these sensitive facilities that are so, the word used when he first reached out to me was fed up. They are fed up with what's happening to the planet. They're fed up with the illegal secrecy and they're fed up with some of the atrocities that are happening that they've been part of. And, you know, it's very emotional for these men. This chairman of the former, you know, former chairman of the Fortune 50 mm -hmm. company, uh, if he comes out, what would he be leaking as a whistleblower to the, to the country, to the world? Well, he'd be leaking that one of the largest corporations in the world, and certainly in America, uh, had worked on these programs, and he has with him in his possession the schematics and plans for these technologies and devices. And uh, he wants to hand them over before he passes away. Um, but he doesn't want to see any collateral damage with his family. So that's why I mentioned, you know, I've been trying to get this sort of uh, protection. And even with that, I'm not sure who wants... You know, people get very cold feet. I mean, I'll tell you a, a weird story that happened uh, in the past year. There was a man who had worked out of the northern Nevada test range. His testimony and information and the drawings of this event are in the archive. We took his name out because he doesn't want to be known publicly yet. Um, but he reached out to me about this, and he was on a retrieval team. So it was at a, uh, if you go from Nellis Air Force Base way north where the atomic the nuclear test range was, where we did open air testing, there's a huge area and there's an underground base there and facility and there's a team, a helicopter pad a team with Delta Force guys and, and then this guy had been part of the retrieval operation in hazmat suits. He was first put in there to retrieve man-made, the triangular UFOs that are coming out of Northrop Grumman and Raytheon mm -hmm. that, that would malfunction mm -hmm. and crash. We have great artist rendition of exactly what these look like. Then he was moved into an operation where they would target, someone was targeting, not him, uh, the extraterrestrial ones, and stun them, and they would go in to retrieve them. And when he realized what we were doing, and uh, he had an encounter with two of these uh, events, extraterrestrial biological entities is what they're called, or aliens. I don't use the word alien because people think of someone from you know, Peru. But um, th what happened is he uh, was so sickened by what they were doing. He tried to separate from the operation, which you generally can't do. But he had an uncle, and we know who he is, very high up in this clandestine program, who helped get him out. But then he subsequently um, went through a whole series of events, including an attempted alien abduction with these fake-looking gray aliens. And he actually knocked one down. We have a great artistic our artist rendering of how it split open what looked like the skin, and they were all fiber optics and integrated circuits and stuff. This stuff is very sophisticated technology, way beyond what people can imagine we might have. So when he reached out to me, he was going to come actually to the National Press Club and the congressional things we did last summer in June, about a year ago. And um, a van pulls up. An SUV pulls up, guys come out, and they say, you step one step further. Look at your phone. And they had put child pornography all over his phone, all over his computers, and says, you won't see your two little children again. Because he was recently in these programs. You'll spend the rest of your life in prison. And he called me up. Now, if some nonsense like that happens to one of my guys now, it'll be monitored. If, you, if they come forward, I hand them off to this special access projects team that have this monitoring capability, they will open a criminal file and arrest and, and open a criminal prosecution of whoever threatens these witnesses. That's what we're setting up because I'm fed up. I mean, I've, you know, I've been carrying this ball and chain for a long time. So that's the kind of stuff that happens routinely. I deal with this every week, every month. We have a new whistleblower comes forward. And these sort of dirty tricks and nasty nonsense, I've been power. I'm a civilian. I, I mean, all this stuff you hear me I'm talking about doing, I've done pro bono without charge in the interest of the public. But, um, you know, I, I, there are, there's, a, there's a critical mass that's happened 
I call it, of very capable military and intelligence and civilian folks who know that it's time for this to come out. And now they have finally put together a way to protect these wonderful... And I have to say, the names you see on that list are incredibly courageous people who've come forward. But sometimes they, they start to come forward and they get such a threat, they back off. Let me, let me ask a couple questions. And that frustrates me because oh. some of the best ones, some of the very best people I'd like to put out in front of the, the Congress and the public, the best ones, I would say, are the ones that they throw the worst dirt at. And, and the tactic is always the same, right? It's public humiliation, embarrassment in front of your family and kids, mm -hmm. ruin your legacy. Mm -hmm. And whether you have done anything for us to blame you or not, we can fabricate it anyways and destroy your entire life. Right. Absolutely. That's the strategy. Go in and clean out your bank account. Yeah. So, yeah. You know what would be a great insurance business mm -hmm. is to find a way to protect you that if anybody ever mm -hmm. tries to do that, you're protected from it. I don't know what the method would be to do that, mm -hmm. but that, that would definitely be a big insurance industry if somebody it could protect you from those types of things. Well, you know but, what I did instead? I did what it's called my dead man trigger. And I've, I have files that no one's ever seen. If something happens to me, and this, I put this in place in the late 90s after I was almost killed. And I said, yeah, if I just flat out get killed, the, the, thing, the stuff that will hit blockchain and internet and sites, it will curl your toes. I mean, the archive is mind blowing, but the stuff I've redacted and the, the, these private files would be even more explosive. And I did it because, you know, the first three people who were killed uh, were, were back in that era. One of them was a former CIA director helping us. I don't know if you remember back in the Ford and Nixon in Ford era, there was a CIA director named uh, William Colby, Bill Colby. Uh, and Bill Colby was read in or briefed on this, was in very much involved. And he was maybe pushing 80 and very fed up. And bless you. Thanks. And he was, he was like, uh, he was over it. So we knew what he was going to do. He was going to hand off to us one of these uh, zero point quantum energy generation devices, free energy, and uh, initially about $50 million in seed money just to get that going and, and hand it off. But he wanted to do it clandestinely, which I thought was very dangerous. He should have done it with, on CNN or news or the whole press conference. But he wanted to do it that way. So there was a colonel who was on my team who was his best friend. And the week he was going to meet with a member of my board, Bill Colby, the CIA, former CIA director, was found floating south of D.C. in the river, made to look like a canoeing accident. Even his wife went on CNN and said he would not have been out there canoeing in a rain-swollen river at dusk. And it was, he was killed. And the, his friend, who's a colonel, uh, said, oh, absolutely. Yep. So that was a shot across the bow. That was in 19... 95 during the Clinton era. And I, what people don't, uh, a, lot of, a lot of people don't think that kind of thing happens. And of course, the media said it was an accident. His son, unfortunately, thinks he committed suicide, which he didn't. He, and that's a terrible thing. Uh, they think your father committed suicide. He did not commit suicide. What's the story of what happened with Nikola Tesla when he got out in a cab and, you know, that mm -hmm. whole story? Yeah, well... You know, he knew too much, too. You know, when, when Albert Einstein was asked by a reporter, what's it like being a genius? You know what he said? Mm. I wouldn't know. Ask Nikola Tesla. Mm -hmm. Nikola Tesla was probably the great genius of the 20th century. And he died a poor man, a bitter man. Most of his huge breakthroughs never saw the light of day. Um, you know, he had one of these sort of electromagnetic generators that was free energy. J.P. Morgan famously told him, if we can't put a meter on it, in charge, like mm -hmm, the utilities, mm -hmm. is not coming out. I mean, we're talking 20s here, 100 years ago. So, you know, it didn't help that he was a genius and had these breakthroughs. And that's why I, it was it was it's like 24 trunks of secret papers. And the day he died, we can prove this, in this archive is a Department of Defense memo to the FBI demanding that the FBI turn those over. And I don't know if they ever did. I, I mean, that happened in 43. The, 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 the document, it's not contested, it's authenticated document, was from the 1980s. 
So eventually someone at the Pentagon realized what the FBI was sitting on in a compartmented black project, and they wanted it. So, you know, the, the untangling the history of this, you know, of course, we'd be here for a week, but it's all in the archive. I mean, it's, it's laborious to go through. It'd probably take people two years just to partially read it and see it. But, um, you know, I just want to say one thing that's missing out of the archive is that I've done, I think it's about 20 intelligence briefings that are being rewritten with links that, were, that aren't in the archive yet. That'll be the first category. They're right now there are 13, so it'll be 14 with this one. And it will relate to each of the categories, crash retrievals, military whistleblowers, technology, you know, the black budget of the United we'll States. We'll put the link to go. So go back to, yeah. to Nicola, though. So what happened that day? New Yorker, he's getting out the hotel. You know, I, I, I'm trying to see how I uh, read the story. Cap hits him. And you're thinking maybe there was an inside job that, you know, broke his ribs or. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who knows? I mean, uh, one of the things that Gordon Crichton said, he was a, a MI6 guy in England. Uh, he's His testimony is in our. He's a British intelligence guy. It's in our uh, archive. You know, he says, if you become too troublesome, they just erase you. And they get rid of you. Uh, and, and, you know, I've, I, I heard that term at first in the 90s, erasure. You, they just erase you. Um, and uh, I, I think that, you know, my, my, like I said, my coming of age of this, I, I was fortunate that when I first started out on this in the early 90s, there was a naval intelligence guy who I thought was an infiltrator, but he was actually very sincere. I didn't know what an unacknowledged special access project was. You know, I'm a doctor. You know, I'm an emergency doctor and four kids and a golden retriever in the suburbs, right? So I had no idea. But, you know, he took me under his wing and mentored me, and um, I learned a lot, and it was a very steep learning curve. Uh, and, and that was before I briefed the CIA director. So by the time I briefed the CIA director, I knew all this. Uh, structure, let's call the structure of the secrecy. And I think that's the hardest thing for senators and congressmen to understand, or the general public. How is this structured? That a president will be told, we're not going to tell you, right? And a few presidents have quipped. Uh, I know that uh, President Carter was, was at an event in Spain. Uh, I have a friend who was there. And uh, he was asked, what was it like being the most powerful man in the world? And Mr. Carter said, I don't think I was that person. And they said, why? He said, there were things that as president I wasn't allowed to know about. And someone kind of giggling, joking, kind of making fun of it. Oh, you mean UFOs? And he said, yes, that and more. Carter said this. Carter said that, President Carter. In an interview. No, in a dinner after uh, an event in, wow. in Spain. And I, But I have a man on my team who was there. So... This is a real issue. This is a huge governance because you're talking unconstitutional. So let's cut to the chase here. These operations are illegal black projects, not legal. And there are legal black projects that the president and the gang of eight in Congress oversee. But these are illegal, meaning there's no oversight and they're being run as a criminal operation. Uh, and I'll just call it out. They are not only criminal, but they're treasonous because they absolutely will defy the chain of command. So uh, here's a really good example. And this letter, this correspondence is in the archive. There's a man uh, who had been the head of the, what's called J2, uh, head of intelligence uh, for the Joint Chiefs of Staff, J2, and Admiral Wilson. And this, a memo leaked out a few years ago, not my doing. Uh, it was after astronaut Ed Edgar Mitchell uh, the sixth man to walk on the moon, after he died, someone leaked this out of his archive because I had brought uh, Dr. Mitchell, astronaut Mitchell, to a briefing at the Pentagon that I was doing a stand-up briefing for Admiral Wilson. And Admiral Wilson was very sincerely wanting to find out about what was going on with this issue. So before the meeting, I sent him a, a secret document it has not been declassified, which is in the archive. By the way, this is different from the, you know, the trouble the president's in with classified material. We declared all these projects unconstitutional and illegal in the 90s, documented it, and therefore I have in this archive classified top secret and secret documents for the public to see. 
and they have not been declassified. I'll just put that on the table. Hmm. So this document said, you know, it was an NRO, National Reconnaissance Office, which runs all the super secret spy satellites, right? And it was from uh, Area 51, Ellis Air Force Base in 1991. And they were warning of some civilians trying to spy on what was going on at that secret facility from some mountaintops overlooking the facility. So they'd had what was called a security alert. But in that document, which I acquired, I won't say how, it listed the project code names and numbers. And that's in the archive. Anyone on Earth can see it now, as of the 90s. So I sent this to Admiral Wilson, along with some other briefing material, and he made an inquiry. Now, remember, this is the head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the United States. And by the time I got to this meeting, he was scared to death and furious because he made inquiries through channels based on the information we had provided. Because, and he discovered the, the offices and the compartmented operations dealing with the UFO matter and he was flat out told, you don't have a need to know. And he said, I'm the head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. How do I not have a need to know, for God's sake? They said, we will not discuss this with you. When he pushed on it further, they threatened him. And they also threatened with taking a star off his lapel, a demotion to retiring, where he would lose a big pay cut in retirement. So that is a fact. Now, the same thing happened to the head of the Defense Intelligence Agency. Google it. The Defense Intelligence Agency is like the CIA, but for the military mm -hmm. intelligence. The director, General Patrick Hughes, I spent hours briefing at the Pentagon. He had a similar thing happen. And he made inquiries through channels and was flat out told nothing. Now, there have been people who have been read in in those positions. Others haven't. Why do some CIA directors or J2 or whoever know and others don't? What we talked about a moment ago. They're tapped early, they come up through the system, and they're carrying water for this criminal o operation. Well, I had Woolsey on the podcast a few years ago. When oh, I, he denies all this. When I spoke to him, I said, so, you know, what was your experience like as a director of CIA? Mm -hmm. He says, you realize I never met Bill Clinton. I said, what do you mean? He says, I never met the president. We never had a meeting. Never communicated with me since I think I had I, one, ex, one encounter was just like when I got appointed or do you want the job or not, and that was it. But there was no communication. And I think he was only the director of CIA for two years, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, maybe two, even less than two years. About two years. Can you look up the time? I said, yeah, it's less than two years when he was a director of CIA. Mm -hmm. So he, he, to me, based on what you're saying, was he one that knew or is he one that doesn't know anything? He's not at the levels of knowing what's really taking place. At the time we met, he didn't know. I think later he, as, as a, when he left the CIA, he was pulled into some operations where he knew, which is why he's, he says very equivocal things about the issue. The same thing is true of, of Admiral Bobby Ray Inman, who is probably at the top of the pyramid of this covert group keeping this secret. Um, you know, I'll, I'll tell you a very almost, almost comical story. Is he alive? Uh, he was as of uh, last a few months ago. So he's at the top of the pyramid. He's very, he's very senior. Uh, Mr. Cheney, him, and a few other people. Have you spoken to him? Have you had meetings with him? I had. Uh, have you ever heard of Senator Barry Goldwater? Of course. The, the, well, he was hugely interested in what we were doing. He was Goldwater. Goldwater, and I went out to his 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 place in in Scottsdale. And what year was that? Right, uh, it was in the nineties. Um, and he was friends with uh, Admiral Inman and. So uh, Senator Goldwater was always trying to find out about this, even when he was running for president. He was, you know, chairman of various committees in the Senate. And, you know, John McCain took his seat. So I'm sitting at his house, and, and Senator uh, Goldwater, you know, starts saying, well, uh, you know, I've given him all the information I have, and he tells me two very interesting things. He said, I was never briefed on this, even as uh, the nominee for president or as the key members of the Senate Armed Services or Intel, n never. He says, but I knew it was real because he had been in the air, he was in World War II. Then he became a, a general reserve in the Air Force Reserve. When he was a general in the Air Force Reserve, he asked at uh, General Curtis LeMay, they used to call him bomb them back to the Stone Age LeMay because he was advocating using uh, nuclear weapons in Vietnam, which is what actually cost uh, Senator Goldwater the election. But in 64. But this is, of course, in the 90s, many years later. And Senator Goldwater says, look, I asked uh, 
he had heard that at Wright Patterson Air Force Base, there was a name, he called it the Blue Room there. And he wanted to be uh, go there. And so he approached General LeMay, who I think at the time was chief of staff of the Air Force. And he's, he says, I want to go there. And Cur General LeMay turned to Senator Goldwater. And we're talking, uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and Senator Goldwater was told point blank by General LeMay that if he ever brought this issue up again, he would have him court-martialed out of the Air Force Reserves. And that he, General LeMay, could not even get into that area anymore. Now, so I, I said, here's a measure of the level of corruption and secrecy. Someone at that level of government, Senator Goldwater, conservative, Republican, pro-military, in the war, being denied access to this information. So, you know, how many data points like that do you need? This is why I tell people, can I prove that these programs are unconstitutional, illegal? Absolutely, we can prove it. And so at that point, here's what really ought to happen. The Criminal Investigative Division of the Pentagon and the FBI should launch immediate criminal investigations into this. There's enough information. Who, in this. who needs to? Well, for domestic, it'd be FBI. Okay. Um, you know, okay. FBI is not going to do that. Well, the not the correct. I, I never say never. Um, and the other would be the criminal investigative division of the of the, of the Pentagon, because the, you know there is enough proof of criminal activity and unconstitutional and treasonous activity to launch those. Now, this is what I've been saying to members of Congress in the last few years since they've started looking into this. I said, you guys are, are you know here rearranging the chairs on the Titanic as it goes down. You really need to understand and learn quickly that, you know, you can make a request through the chain of command and you're going to be told nothing like Woolsey, nothing like General Hughes, DIA director, nothing like Admiral Wilson and all the dozens of other people like that. And by the way, this pattern you can replicate in the United Kingdom, Australia, because I have had meetings with the uh, Minister of Defense directors for Canada, Australia, and the United Kingdom, none of them were given access. And they, they all have told me, you know, th this never came, they, they, they were never were told. And then subsequently, they would have learned that, oh, there were operations right under their nose that were deep black illegal operations. So um, th this pattern is, is a dangerous pattern in terms of governance, but also for world security national security and the future of the planet and humanity. There's nothing good that comes from that kind of corruption. And so at some point, some people with real courage are going to have to step up to the plate. Or, you know, I, I, frankly, we're going to hell in a handbasket very quickly on this planet. Uh, excuse my language. But it, it's, it's just we're not in a place where we can keep kicking this ball down the road. But that is typically what politicians want to do. They just want to kick the ball down the road. Like when Admiral said, Admiral, uh, uh, he says, I just, I just want to retire from this command and retire at my place in Montana and go fishing. This is too much to take on. And this was a man uh, who was the head of, uh, in charge of CONUS, Continental United States Security. Um, so I hear this, I've heard all this for so many years. You know, and this is why I'm, I'm very encouraged, actually, that this special access project has been stood up to protect whistleblowers and that there are people defecting at a very high level from operational uh, programs at, at, that are running these, uh, you know, systems out, out in the Western desert. And separate from that, there's an entire group of special forces guys that I've been meeting with who are asking to eventually get authorized to uh, strike these facilities. How did these people that are the powerful people that even Barry Goldwater couldn't get up to and President Carter couldn't get up to, President Trump is asked the other day by Logan Paul about UFOs. Yeah, His answer was very ge generic. This one man told me that there are things up there, but mm -hmm. you know he wasn't really given the answer. Um, well, no, I mean, because you know, as one pr what president said, I'm only the president. 
Oh, there was some, and that's true. I mean, it's like the comedy, uh, you know. Um, but it, that that needs to change. Now, there, there, are, there are people I know who are very good friends with Mr. Trump. And, you know, I, I actually meet, met with Mr. Biden when he was chairman of Foreign Relations uh, Committee back a long time ago. But he wouldn't touch this with a 10-foot pole. Um, and uh, Who is the most powerful person in America? <laughs> oh, I don't think anybody would probably know their name. You know, they're sort of behind the scenes. But certainly people on this committee, like uh, Admiral Wilson now, you know, he, he, you know here's, here's the lineage. He was, uh, uh, he was deputy director of CIA. Then he was the director of the National Security Agency. Then he moved on to the board of wait for it, Science Applications International Corporation. Who's this? Admiral Bobby Ray mm -hmm. So if you look at that, often there's a trajectory where they're brought in and brought up. Uh, but where they end up, the revolving door out of government and senior military intelligence, you, I keep seeing this pattern that the center of gravity are in these big contracting entities like uh, SAIC and Raytheon and Northrop and... Lockheed and so forth. So that's where the action is. I think the center of gravity isn't in the government at all. Was Mr. Bush Sr. ever one of these high-ranking people that was on the inside or no? Oh, absolutely. George H.W. Oh. Bush? Yes. Yes. W, no. But George H.W. Bush, he was the one who threatened Bill Clinton. But stay quiet. There's none of your business. I have a witness to, the, to Mr. Clinton sharing that. George H.W. Bush, senior. Yes, it's, it's none of your business, but out. Because Mr. Clinton had stood up what's called Red Team. Red Team was a military special operation. To The blue team was conventional military. Black team were these illegal operations. Clinton had authorized, I have a whole document on this. It's not in the archive, but it's definitely in my dead man trigger. That was called Red Team. And these were people trying to infiltrate these illegal black projects but most of them either got absorbed or killed. Uh, and eventually, George H.W. Bush said, back off. Uh, this is none of your business. Did he? Oh, yeah. Absolutely he did. That's why they became fast friends. And towards, remember? Did he, did he, I do. Did he ever make it, was, was Bush ever in a top five most powerful men in America or no? Was he still, there's people above him that he's reporting to. He, he would have been on the mid- to upper level of that committee, two, 300 people. But George H.W. Bush was definitely involved. Uh, and, and I, I would say, ironically, Cheney more so, Mr. Cheney. Cheney more so. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Because of who he is. and On the military-industrial complex, the all money. The way, all the way back to the, what was he, Ford uh, Defense Secretary. I mean, all the way back to 70s, 80s. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, how how powerful was it? Kissinger? Was he anybody? Very. Oh, yes. Okay. And Above A. Cheney? Sure. Absolutely. So he was one of the 200. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yes. Mr. Kissinger. Yes. What's your opinion on him? It's unfortunate. I mean, you know, I think he's a very brilliant man, but, you know, I think he, he moved us in a lot of corrupt directions and harmful directions. Such as? This issue, for one, <laughs> because... and. I don't want to go too much. I mean, he's passed away. So it's irrelevant. I don't speak too badly of him. But, um, yeah, I think he would have been very way high in that pecking order. Uh, but was very interested in, I hate to say this, subverting American power for global power. So this is a pattern you see. And, and it's not that I'm against you know international relations or all that. But there is a concerted effort, in my opinion, to subvert and, and make subordinate uh, American power and interest to some of these global uh, schemes and, and agendas. And, and Kissinger was really one of the original architects of that. Um, but because you, have, you can't take this UAP, UFO secrecy issue out of context with all of these other concerns, you know, national security, world security, energy, financial, I mean, for heaven's sakes, the petrodollar, right, from Bretton Woods after World War II. Um, you know, the reserve currency of the world is the dollar. But it's mainly because it's the petrodollar. It's the, it's the currency of exchange and 
trading in oil and, and commodities and everything else. Um, so this is all extremely complicated. You release this information that we're not, not only are we not alone in the universe, but we've already figured out I, I, how they operate. And I will tell you right now, the extraterrestrial issue part of this is nowhere near as sensitive a secret as the part that deals with the technologies that we have, humans have, in the hands of people who are misusing them and are withholding the beneficial ones from humanity and from the planet. That is a much bigger secret. So far when I asked you, you know, Barry Goldwater, you know, he's there, but he's not has Bobby Ray Inman. Okay, so Bobby Ray Inman has more influence than he does. Oh, way more. Then I went to um, President Clinton, and you said, no, George H.W. Bush Sr. has more influence than he does. Great. Dead. He's passed away. He's dead. He's passed away. Dead. Then I asked you about um, Kissinger. No, then you said Dick Cheney mm -hmm. was more powerful mm -hmm. than Sr. Okay. Then I asked you Kissinger. You said, no, Kissinger was more mm -hmm. in that community of that influence. And, and very global with it. And For sure. It, I mean, yeah. And he had a very interesting reputation. Yep. Fascinating guy to study, by the mm -hmm. way. Some of the things he, he is, said. Yeah. He said, uh, the, the, the illegal, we can do fast. The unconstitutional takes a while. It said something like that. He did. So, it, it, stuff, it's actually yeah. in our archive, that quote. Yeah. yeah. You know, he said, yeah, the illegal we can do immediately. Yeah, no yeah, problem. Unconstitutional takes a, while. Takes a little yeah. longer. Interesting guy. Very yeah. interesting guy. Womanizer, playboy, liked at one point. Sexiest man, I think, in 1972. All the stuff that you read about him. Interesting guy. Okay. Um, so then go up above that. Who do you know that you will put even above Kissinger from the last 70 years that we would know about? A name you would know. Uh, Right off the top of my head, I can't th think of one. Um, certainly, you know, some of the corporate folks that nobody would think of. Tillerson? Uh, would, would be very powerful. Um, you know, Jack Welch of uh, General Electric. Jack Welch you would put ahead of? Very high up. Now, at a certain point, you know, it's not a pecking order. They, they collaborate, and I think, but what I understand, that committee... Uh, collaborates and it sort of squabbles. But, you know, when I was first told about it, you know, back in, in the early days, you used to talk about uh, there were these documents that got released called the Majestic 12, MJ-12. And nobody knows if they're authentic or not. I think they are largely authentic. But what's not in dispute is this NRO document from the 90s. And one of the compartment operations is... Uh, M-A-J-I, MAJI, or, Ma or sometimes you'll see M-A-J-I-C, and it stands for the Majority Joint Intelligence Committee. And that is the group that is a joint entity it, on the U.S. end of this that deals with this subject. And that is in the document. You can pull it up. It's the National Reconnaissance Office document, Nellis Air Force Base, 1991. So can you pull up Majestic 12, Rob? I just want to read. Is this Majestic 12? Also known as Magic 12 is a... Uh, uh, organization by President UFO Conspiracy Theories, the organizations claim to be the code name of an alleged secret committee of scientists, military leaders, and government officials formed in 1947 by an executive order by Her President Harry Truman mm -hmm. to facilitate recovery and investigation of alien spaceships, spacecrafts. The concept originated in a series of supposedly leaked secret uh, government documents first circulated by ufologists. In 1984, right. uh, upon examination, the Federal Bureau FBI declared the documents to be complete bogus, and many ufologists considered them to be elaborate hoax. Mm -hmm. Majestic 12 remains popular among some UFO conspiracy theories, and the concept has appeared in popular culture, including television, film, and literature. Here's what I think actually happened. Hmm. If you want to hide something, you hide it in plain sight. So a great deal of information in those documents is true. But the way they came about was a hoax. So, so if you're involved with counterintelligence and information's coming out, you want to divert people to something that the provenance is going to be a problem. And that way it takes them down. The National Security Agency guy described it to me this way. He was the right hand to General Odom back in the day, uh, who was the director of the NSA. And he said, we call this a DDT operation. You set up a, a decoy you distract people, and then you trash them. 
And so by releasing things that are of questionable provenance, then it can, you sort of put it out there and much of the information may be correct, but because the provenance is bogus, it takes the information down with it. So one of the things that's very complicated is understanding how counterintelligence and disinformation works on this. It's Byzantine. It's complicated. It takes a lot to unravel it. And that's why I tend to be very careful with both witnesses and documents if I don't have a good provenance for it. Um, so, I mean, uh, that is something that's hard to do uh, when you're you're trying to run an operation like we do without any, uh, you know, uh, real clearance. I mean, we, we you have to rely on people and their credibility and what documentation they can prove. And I think what's most important, the reason I'm releasing this this archive is that if you go through it carefully, you see where the dots all connect. But these intelligence briefings we're working on, the modules, we call these intelligence modules, th when those get put in, it's going to connect all these dots. Um, and that's a big undertaking that we're working on right now. Jamie Dimon, where do you put him? Mm -hmm. Is Jamie Dimon a person all the way at the top or not really? I wouldn't know. I don't know anything about him. You don't know anything about I Jamie I have no Dimon. information. On Elon, him. What, do you, what do you think about Elon Musk? And what role, is he like a Nikola Tesla? Is he a good guy in your eyes? Is he somebody that... You know, the establishment can't stand? Is he someone they can't control? Well, I, I think that certainly if he was inclined to research this end of it, he, he wouldn't be making a, I call it a fake Tesla. I mean, a real Tesla car wouldn't have to be plugged in. It most certainly wouldn't have 900 and some pounds of lithium ion batteries. Um, it would be an electromagnetic gen. You know, if you look at this uh, archive, we have this whole account of, of this inventor named Floyd Sweet. He had something the size a little bit bigger than a cigarette pack. And, th and this was back in the 80s. And we have all the documentation on this. Huge files on it. And it was running a 300 horsepower motor that could run your, your car. And it never had to be plugged in. I think the battery started up with some very tiny uh, battery. You know. And once that circuit started, it was pulling energy out of what's called the quantum vacuum. Some people call it the zero-point energy field. But let's describe what that is. You see your, your, um, your tea glass there, that mug. Mm -hmm. The amount of potential energy in the space in that mug is enough energy to boil off all the oceans of the Earth. It's been quantified. And that's called the zero-point energy field. So if you understand the physics of these very high voltage, VHV, we call them, very high voltage systems, where at certain, it may be a mil, a millions of volts, but at very low power, but at certain cycles per second, certain frequencies, you can tap into that. It depends on what material you're using. To the average, explain zero point energy to the average person. Well, so visualize just the space around you. Mm -hmm. And everything around you, if you get down to, uh, by classic defini definition, it's the energy left after even all subatomic particles have been brought down to you know minus 270 some degrees Kelvin, uh, but there's still this energy field that, that that's the baseline energy field that all of matter, space, time, subatomic particles are fluxing in and out of. And interestingly, the early Lockheed man-made UFOs were called flux liners because they were tapping into that energy field, the quantum flux. So that's basically it. And it's a huge, I mean, I think Nikola Tesla called it the infinite energy field. And Professor Dirac, and modestly called it the Dirac C. But uh, a, a scientist named uh, Dr. Casimir, C-A-S-I-M-E-R, back in the 30s, po postulated this, but then proved its existence in the 50s, another important date. And it's called the Casimir effect. The scientific uh, information on that is also in the, this intelligence archive. So, you know, I wasn't even born when, when Professor Casimir proved the existence. Now, what's debated amongst scientists currently is that you can tap into it from a practical point of view, but you can. And, and the proof is, you know what the proof is? Look at one of those UFOs moving. No jets, no rockets, no internal combustion engines, no nuclear, no heat signature. In fact, when you get those things operational, temperature actually goes down. If you're in a hangar with two or three of these things hovering, 
like we have the pictures in our archive of what's called the ARB there at the Norton Air Force Base mm-hmm. in 1988. It actually is like an air conditioning. It cooled it down. So not only do you not have heat coming off of it, it actually pulls temperature down somewhat. Um, and so there's so many applications of, of these sciences. I mean, think about it. It'd be free energy, refrigeration, cooling ser- server forms, farms, if you're concerned about climate change for whatever reason. But even people who don't think there's climate change due to pollution, there's five plus million people a year die from particles, from emissions, uh, coal and gas and oil, and not to mention radiation causing cancer from nuclear. And uh, all of that would be replaced. See, Pat, I mean, all that's gone. Now, that's the good news. The bad news is you're stepping on the toes of hundreds of trillions of dollars in assets, not just the market cap of these big corporations, but the commodities. Think of what's traded on the Chicago Board of Trade, you know, just in, in futures and commodity trading. It's trillions. So all of that, you know, you're not trading commodities. Anymore. I'm surprised you don't, you're not uh, studying much of Jamie Dimon or Larry Fink or BlackRock or some of these guys because who is funding all these programs? Where are they getting the money from? Oh, yeah. Well, well Goldman Sachs and BlackRock definitely have involvement uh, with these operations. And, um, you know, the, the, the more current people who are involved, the more it's shadowy. But when people get mm-hmm. older or pass away, then they start talking. Let me give you a great example. After World War II, uh, at the end of the war, there was a man named Paul Mellon, who was, you know, the Mellon Carnegie, the Mellon family, you know, one of the few billionaires in the world in World War II. His grandson has worked with me, who was also a senator, uh, Warren, John Warner's son. And Senator John Warner was a, like a lower level operative on this uh, majority, yes. Uh, and... So Paul Mellon, he went over and at the end of World War II with General Patton and Alan Dulles, and they confiscated this disc that was uh, an early attempt to make an electromagnetic anti-gravity thing. It wasn't fully operational, but they brought it back to the United States. And how do we know this? Because towards the end of his life, Paul Mellon... Uh, who was very instrumental with Alan Dulles and forming the CIA and all that stuff. Remember, the OSS became the CIA, the OSS during World War II. And uh, when he was getting older, he had had a couple martinis and told his grandson, John Warner IV, that in fact he had gone over there and brought this thing back and that it, it was not when the jet rocket thrusters, it was electromagnetic and anti-gravity. And so, I mean, that we're talking now night, the end of World War II in, in Germany in 1945. So that is, is something. What you find is that as some of these folks get older, before they meet their maker, as it were, they start telling things to me or to other uh, family members who, who then share it. Uh, so that's, you know, a pattern that in terms of, you know, I have debriefed, you know, if you look at this list, there's 760 whistleblowers and witnesses, but I've met with more. Some of them, I never quite get their name. There's probably over a thousand, but all the people on that list I've debriefed, (laughs) I mean, over 34 years. So I carry that in my head, which is why I'm trying to put some of this down, you know, in case something happens to me. Which president have you had direct contact with, you spoke to, that is interested in this? I've never spoken directly with any of the presidents. You've only, never spoken only people directly. who've been on their cabinet or people who have been like the CIA director or people work with them. No, I've never got it. I've never met with any of them directly. All of them been asked to. Any of the recently. recent who's the most recent, most powerful people you've spoken to that's in that's reached out to you? Mm-hmm. Oh, I think by far this former chairman of the this Fortune fifty company. I mean he's he's holding all the cards. Is he is he respected by a lot of people? Is he somebody that has a reputation? Oh yes, he is. he would be. Yeah. He very much would he, he would be. So mm-hmm. so okay. As a president, you get to campaign. You're I'm not okay, I'm gonna run for president twenty twenty four. I'm cam- campaigning for human rights. I mean we're gonna fix the border. You know, we're gonna go Climate change is a number one issue and the economy is stupid and then we're gonna focus on all this <laughs> stuff. Right? All these things that they say they're campaigning on. Okay, great. Mm-hmm. What, what's the riskiest thing to campaign on? Let me kind of give you a couple of them and you tell me, okay? Mm-hmm. One, um, here's what my campaign is going to be. 
Why is it that only two countries in the world allow Big Pharma to advertise on TV? Us and New Zealand. Why are all the other countries not allowing that to happen? If you help me become president, day one executive order, Big Pharma will not be able to advertise on TV, just like cigarette and tobacco companies cannot, Mm -hmm. okay? There's a lot of risk with that, okay? You're going after a lot of strong people, right? Oh, yeah. Number two. Number two. You, you, uh, you know, uh, as your president, I think one of the things that you as a taxpayer are owed the truth. And I think this government in the recent years, we used to be an open source type of a country when Washington and all the guys ran it. Today, we are no longer open source. If you help me become president, I'm going to release all the 6,000 patents in the Invention Secrecy Act of 1951. And I want to make sure you know all about it. And it's going to help a lot of you guys. You're going to save money on electricity. You're going to save money on oil. And cars are going to be able to run on this because it's going to help us with this. And that's going to help us with pollution. And we're no longer going to deal with poverty worldwide. It's never. You help me. I'm going to make sure all that becomes public. Okay. You help me become president. I'm going to give the truth of what happened with CI, and I'm going to release the last 15% of the information to know who assassinated John F. Kennedy. Mm -hmm. You helped me become president. All of these things I'm going through. What is the riskiest one for your life that if you say you're going to do that, ain't nobody going to help you, and it's the riskiest position to take? Well, I think in terms of of your own personal security, it'd probably be this issue, the UFO and and, uh, UAP issue. Uh, Why, though? Why would that be? Because behind it is the whole center of power that was running the planet, the technology. Because if that comes out, all of it's coming out. Look, anybody with a a grain of sense, if, if... And this is where we're getting really close. Like when the Pentagon confirmed that that UAP that we chased off the coast of California was real and three dimensional and not uh, an artifact or a misperception, broad daylight. What they admitted to without saying it is that there's there's something that's there that's three dimensional and real that is absolutely defying the aerodynamics and, and energy of anything known uh, thought by the public. Now, not known to man, and not and certainly not not known to to these clandestine programs. But so going into that, then you're 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 also here's the other big risk. The only reason this could have been kept secret is that the big corporate media, left, right, center, all of it is corrupt. I have done, there's a whole section in here about You're me. convinced all of it is corrupt. Absolutely corrupt. And the proof of it is, why would they, given what we've already put on the street and had press conferences around, and, and right here, 122 named whistleblowers, what, why isn't that being covered by Fox CNN, MSNBC, New York Times, Washington Post. So if you go in here, you will see that on certain issues, the media is actually the most culpable for the secrecy because the fourth estate, which is what the media is called, and you know, is supposed to be a watchdog against these excesses of the government and, and abuses of power. And we're talking the biggest abuse of power in my lifetime, and in, in certainly in the last 70 to 80 years. And why wouldn't there be investigations on that? So let me tell you a little story. It's apocryphal. But Mike Wallace was a famous uh, reporter for 60 Minutes mm-hmm. on CBS. Mm-hmm. A good friend of his, his name, Bob Schwartz, was on the board mm-hmm. of, of uh, Time Life. I knew him very well. And I was at a meeting in New York back in the 90s. And, and Mr. Schwartz told me about how Mike Wallace had gotten some government documents from a source about the UFO issue. And he said, this is the biggest story in history. This is the biggest secret in U.S. history. And he was going to do a 60-minute special on it. At the time, Westinghouse, the defense contractor, owned CBS. And basically, out from the top, Mike Wallace was told, you'll do no such thing. And he went into a very deep depression. In fact, he went on Larry King and admitted he'd become suicidal because he re- realized he was a fraud. He used that word. Now, he didn't tell this part of the story. His, his friend Bob Schwartz told me at a salon you know, in New York, I think. He who, told Larry King he thinks he's a fraud? Mike Wallace did. You can go find that. Scene. He says, I, you know, why were you? He says, well, I just thought I was a fraud. And this, 
So somewhere in there. Now, I saw that episode, and what, what Bob Schwartz said, Robert Schwartz said, look, he was so devastated because he thought, here we are, the premier investigative journalist. We take on anything. He had never been told he couldn't do a story. He was not allowed to do this story. He was flat out stood down, sat down hard and said, no, you will not. Now, I have dealt with many me media people very high up, and they've had the same thing happen to them. There was a guy named Ira Rosen who was the executive producer of 2020 and Primetime Live. And after the first National Press Club event uh, that we did in 2001, May, is 23 years ago, um, he approached me and he wanted to have this first sort of tranche of whistleblowers and witnesses come forward. And so he came out to my home, my farm in Virginia, uh, near uh, University of Virginia, and I gave him 35 digital hours of summaries of these testimony and hundreds of pages of government documents. He says, if this is true, this is the biggest story ever in U.S. history. I said, yeah, it is. So he, I said, but I don't think they're going to let you do it. He says, oh, well, I'm the executive producer of this and that. He had been with, by the way, 60 Minutes. And he, I think he's back there now. I'm not sure. Anyway, this is a long time ago, 20-some years ago. And he, he's, I said, Ira, I don't think they're going to let you. A couple weeks later, he calls me up. He says, well, Dr. Greer, you're right. They won't let me do this story. I said, oh, Ira, who are they? And he says, Dr. Greer, you know who they are. And, and so we, we stayed in touch for a few years. Now, I can tell you account after account after account like that. So when you get really close to truth, now if you cover nonsense or something that's disinformation or, you know, I was attacked by an alien and raped and have babies floating around Alpha Centauri, they'll cover that. I mean, the media will be happy to cover nonsense. But when you have hard evidence, interesting, they're not going to cover it. And I don't care how high you are, you think you are, in that food chain in the media. I challenge anyone listening to do that. Now, look what happened to Tucker Carlson. He, I don't know if you know who Tucker Carlson is. He was uh, on Fox. I was on the show a month ago. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I would like to be on it. But see, he got gaslit. He had a whole bunch of disinformation people come to him and provided him with enormous amount of false information. And um, so... One of the problems is, you know, a little knowledge is a very dangerous thing on this issue. And it's very easy for someone with a limited amount of access and information to have people come in and steer them in the direction of the aliens are eating us for lunch and taking our babies, right? That whole rubbish. And, but that is really the stock and trade. So if you move in that direction, doors will open. Mm. If you actually start putting out the truth every door will close. Same thing with Hollywood. You know, I had uh, Arnold Kupelson, who was a huge billion dollar producer back in the 90s. And you'll see in the archive, 1997, I did a congressional briefing offsite with the first early gathering, or the second early gathering of whistleblowers. Mm -hmm. The first gathering was 1995 at Asilomar in California. This was 97 in DC, but at the um, Georgetown Weston. And so members of Congress came, and uh, Dan Burton, who was chairman of Oversight, came. And, and uh, you know, this was all, you know, there were really people really were very interested in hearing this. This was not public. It wasn't in the news. And um, w what I found was one of the, the men who came, he was going to tell the members of Congress that next day. We had a day first where we met about having been on an interagency committee back in the 70s, where they could hit a button, basically, and stage an alien attack on the planet and all that. And that all that had been in place before he got there, and I think it was 73 or 4. That night, some guys that he had worked with came to the hotel, took him from his hotel room to a secure site out in Virginia until those briefings for members of Congress was over. Now, some of the raw footage of that meeting is in this archive now. Uh, I mean, it was old Hi-8 or, or VHS tape, but it's not cinematic. It's not a production, but it's interesting, very interesting. Ever since you released this, has anybody weird reached out to you? Mm -hmm. well, well, people weird reach out to me all the time. But um, I'm talking threats. I'm talking we're going to release this thing you did 22 years ago. Oh, sure. You know, stuff I mean, that like happens that. all the time. You know, I just ignore it, and I have... What's good with the folks who, who are around me now 
they monitor what's going on around me. Uh, one of your friends before we came in here asked me this, and I said, nothing like that's going to happen and not be known. And so now that there's a SAP stood up to literally arrest and, and create a criminal case against someone who, who pulls those kind of illegal operations, you, know, you can't threaten. I mean, if you threaten someone, that is in itself a crime, right? Yeah, but I mean, they do it all but, the time. But they do it all the, the time. Regular Tuesday for them. Yeah, but now this will be trapped. If be, oh, with this thing that you have, that's I'm, just I'm really starting curious uh, to, June twentieth. You know, I'm really curious to know what the level of uh, credibility and protection will be. Um, well, we'll see. I mean, yeah, exactly. I, that's I, 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 I trust the director of, of of the team that's liaison. This three letter d- uh, organization, the group. Yeah, and and we've spent a lot of time. Are they three letter or no? Whatever. I mean, uh, there are only so many three letter agencies that we're not going to. So we know that. But, but it has domestic authority. So um, and are, they, are they powerful? Are they powerful enough where they carry, you know, weight? Well, here, here's the Achilles heel with that it's a SAP, a special access project. And by definition, it's top secret, it's compartmented. So it's operating under the authority of the, its immediate supervisor. But it wouldn't go up to the director of that agency. Who do they report to? Independent, because it's a SAP. Yeah, it, it, that's right. It's closed. So they, they, they hold their own clearance, and, but they've been authorized. Their group has been authorized to take these people, put protection and monitor. Let me ask you, is it kind of like an independent uh, PMC, except it's an independent CIA version of what a PMC is? No, I mean, it, it, it can't be independent totally, but the way compartmented operations are, it's on a need-to-know basis. So, but they have access to governmental information or no? Oh, yeah, and, and also monitoring. Who gives them permission to do that? Who, well, the people who've, who've authorized and formed the SAP. And you know, where it goes beyond that, I don't know. Because these, remember, it, the, the idea that let's say you're the director of the uh, CIA, mm-hmm. you, you're not signing off on all the thousands of compartmented SAPs and operations. In fact, I, they've told me, Woolsey told me he barely knows what's going on. He I did. know. Woolsey said he knew nothing. He's like, yeah, they he, kept things away from him. That's what he told me. But that's what, they, that's what they all say. Because that's it's not what true. Comey said. You know, Comey, you know, Comey. Well, they're not lying about that because th- th- this thing is so huge. Here's one of the problems that Eisenhower warned about. That he's right. Is that this is like a multi-headed monster that's gotten created. And it's so big and it's so out of control. And if you think members of Congress or overseeing these things, or the president, I, not just this president, any president. I'm very nonpartisan, I have to be. Or the National Security Council, you're mistaken. And they, they're dealing with so many conventional issues that this issue, because they don't know about it, they say, wow, well, it's the X-Files, it's a joke, it's nonsense. Um, now, there, there, are, there are good people in Congress now. I would say Mark Warner and Rubio and uh, Gillibrand and, her, and the co-chair of Armed Services and Burchett, uh, Luna, Moskowitz, who's here. I mean, Moskowitz is very interested. I've spoken with him. He's your representative for Fort Lauderdale, part of this area. And, you know, they're sincerely wanting to get to the bottom. The problem is they have no dedicated staff or funding. And one of the bad news things I want to report today is a few weeks ago I met with members of House Oversight, and they were aiming to get subpoena power and a select committee that was funded. Because you need a staff of a couple dozen people just to unpack 10% of this archive I have and really then start an investigation properly. They don't have that. So when, you, when I meet with their staffers, you know, like one of them who is the most senior guy for Senate intelligence, he says, I've been told I can spend 20, 10% of my time on this. Mm-hmm. He ended up spending 50%. There was a huge burden. And uh, he's the one who, who said, look, can you give me what you have? I said, yes. And the genesis of the archive, by the way, ironically, was that they were supposed to put funding in place. So there'd be a couple dozen people uh, going through my files and archives and information, digitizing them, which they were all in paper and file cabinets, and then going through intelligence analysis and, and un, unpack it. That never got funded. So I, over the last couple of years, I've spent about half a million dollars personally to get 
that done uh, with some help and some donors with a skeleton crew of, you know, a couple people and some volunteers. So that's why the archive is still not fully organized yet. I'll admit it needs a lot of work. But I wanted to get it out there for the public as sort of a... Yeah. Let me let me let me ask this question on the nuclear side, right? You know, you hear stories about, you yeah. know, a lot of times when the aliens show up is when we're in war or nuclear, you know, Absolutely. fears and all this stuff. And then you hear about the time where Eisenhower is on vacation and he steps away for a few days. Apparently, allegedly, he met with aliens because aliens said, you give us the nuclear stuff. We're mm -hmm. going to give you some powerful technology. The world was so worried about it that even Associated Press reported that Eisenhower is dead. He died from, you know, cancer or heart attack. They just made up some kind of a story. Right. And he was alive all along. Now, you know, some say that's a myth. Some say that's true. No, I have, some, a, I have a document from the Ministry of Defense I, I want to hear it. That's, uh, so. Well, that's in here, too. And there was a man who reported out about that meeting. It was at MUROC, M-U-R-O-C. It's, it's sort of near where Edwards Air Force Base is now. It didn't exist at the time in 1956 or 7 when it happened. But yeah, that did happen. And you're spot on in bringing up this point, that when we started detonating atomic and then thermonuclear weapons, mm -hmm. uh, what people, everyone knows what an electromagnetic pulse is. What they don't know is that embedded in that is what's called a scalar pulse. And Nikola Tesla was one of the original researchers of scalar electromagnetic. And to make it simple, the light we're seeing or electromagnetic is a wave like this, like a sine wave. And it propagates at 186,000 miles per second. Scalar, or it's also called longitudinal, is a point and a line that goes out, boom, boom at multiples of speed of light. But if when it's done in an in a uncontrolled way, it rips the fabric of inter or trans-dimensional space-time, which disrupts extraterrestrial communications and transport systems. So when we detonated the first atomic bomb, boom, all of a sudden there were ET vehicles investigating everything we were doing on this planet. Because it wasn't just that we were on a path where we could kill ourselves. We were disrupting other operations that are extraterrestrial. And very few people understand this. Now, there is an FBI document in the archive. I understand once we released it, it became the most viewed document on the FBI website. Which one? And it was a memo from Guy Hotel, H-O-T-T-E-L, to J. Edgar Hoover from 1947 from Roswell where, you know, we had those, uh, it turned out, three ET vehicles that went down. Uh, one wasn't found until 50, 1950 or 51. And it's a memo where he said um, that apparently, yes, apparently the, uh, we, we retyped it because it's so hard, it's so old and hard to read in the 40s, that when they had a new, quote, radar system that when they switched it on, messed up the guidance systems of these ET vehicles, these disks that crashed. Well, remember, radar is a euphemism for both a, what you think of radar, where you kind of paint the fuselage, on it's, it's, you know, go, the beams that go out and bounce off an aircraft, metallic, come back, and you track it. But they are also, radar is used to track, but then embedded in it can be an active system. And so what they had done, they had put a classified... By 47, they knew these ET craft were all around our nuclear facilities. Roswell was the only nuclear bomb squadron in the world, or atomic bomb squadron, technically. It wasn't nuclear yet. And a thermonuclear. It was atomic, like at Hiroshima, Nagasaki. But that was the only place on the Earth, was the Roswell Army Air Base. And so they were trying to track and knock these things down. So that new radar that's mentioned here hit and it caused, they embedded the scalar signal, and it really, these are all electromagnetic craft. They're guidance systems or propulsion. So it's not like you're hitting them with a, a missile or a laser. It's these weird directional energy weapons that are cross over into the scalar area. And to this day, you know, when I was over the black site in September, about a month before I got injured, there was uh, these massive electromagnetic pulse generators, but they also have embedded in them. So you can target an object with that, hit it, but you also have the scalar, and that can cause these ET craft to get stunned 
or lose control and crash. So some of the people I'm working with currently have been on those retrieval teams that are actively still doing that. In fact, one of the sites I went over, and I'll show you this video, that one or two ET craft per year are knocked down there. And uh, it's very worrisome. The worse is that if a civilian aircraft goes in over that temporary flight restriction area, they knock it down. Let me ask you this. When we're talking, we're talking murder. Here. Yeah. So, no, I mean, listen, this is, this, is, uh, th this is weird stuff. And that's still know, going on. Right. That is still the, happening today, right now as we speak. The, the level of technology. Okay, some mm -hmm. of the stuff that we got, zero point energy, teleporting, like the, the yep. concept of teleporting. Is that something that's out of the ordinary? Is that currently, do we have access to it? How long mm -hmm. have we had it? Who invented it? Is it being used? What's the worry with that? Why are they not releasing it if they have access? There's a lot of questions with it, obviously. Well, all of it. I mean, they don't release it. They don't want anyone to know about it. But uh, if you look at the uh, testimony of one of our witnesses, Fred Threadfeld, 1953, he was at a Canadian Air Force base. And they were experimenting with that so-called teleportation. And he said it was so funny. They were using, you know, everyone smoked back then, these big ashtrays. And it would be, you know, an electromagnetic system here and at the other end of the base, another one. And this, this ashtray would go boom. Teleport. Now, you know, Einstein, when he said the same particle could be in two places at once, he called it the spooky effect. But really what it is is what's called quantum entanglement, where every point in space and time is connected to the other. And if you look up quantum entanglement, that's what this is. But imagine doing that not just with a particle, but with a whole object or a spacecraft. So those experiments were going on also, 30s, 40s, 50s. Uh, but when they began to unpack and really have some of the most brilliant minds, I mean, I will tell you, the smartest people I've ever met, uh, with certainly IQs north of mine, uh, have been working on these projects in underground. So you're That's convinced it. teleportation is a real thing? Oh, it certainly can be done. When, when, you, when you're reading it, it says teleportation is the theoretical transfer of matter or energy from one point to another without traversing the physical space between them. It is a common subject in science fiction, fantasy, literature, oh, film, sure. video games, and television. In some situations, mm -hmm. teleporting is presented as time traveling across space to use of matter transmitters and science mm -hmm. fiction originated at least as early as 19th century. An example, <laughs> an early example of scientific uh, teleportation uh, is found in an 1897 novel, To Venus in Five Seconds by Fred Jane. <laughs> Jane's protagonist is transported <laughs> from a strange machinery containing gazebo on Earth to planet Venus. A common fictional device for teleportation is a warm hole. In video games, the instant teleportation of a player character may be referred to as a warp. So if, if that exists... Well, it does. I mean, how are you going to go from one star system to another? Just, just bear me with me a minute. If you're in a, a one percent of the way through our galaxy, the mm -hmm. Milky Way is a thousand light years, mm -hmm. which at the speed of light, you, which you can't go because as you accelerate the speed of light, you become infinitely massive. So, it would be a thousand years one way, a thousand years another. So, in order to traverse interstellar space, and this was concluded early on by the fact they were here, and we downed some of them. You have to do basically your bending space time. So visualize this like a piece of paper. I don't have one, but uh, you know, it, 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 you have a star system here and we're here. Instead of going in a straight line, even at enormous velocities, like our space shuttle or mm -hmm. what have you, mm -hmm. through these very high voltage electromagnetic systems that also create gravitational waves, you can bend space time. So the piece of paper does this. So you, the two points come right here. So you're, you're actually, that's where you get into this whole non-locality in physics and quantum entanglement in an applied setting. So the fact that, you know, it's relegated to science fiction is fine. It doesn't mean that it isn't being done because it has to be. You're not going to be able to travel through uh, interstellar distances in any way during uh, any species lifespan without obliterating, as it were, linear space-time. And it doesn't mean you're not traversing, but you're, you're moving trans-dimensionally. So let's look at it from the point of view of, uh, it's like a quantum hologram. You know, a hologram where like 
if you had a hologram of Marilyn Monroe with her skirt, if you zoomed in on one little part of it, it would have the entirety of her image in it and then zoom in again and zoom in. So when you're talking about a quantum sort of holographic view of the universe, which is a correct one, then you're not traveling in a straight line. And you're using, however, a whole new area of physics. And this is not going to be in your physics textbook or at MIT. It, it's in these classified areas. And that's why I tell people, I, I'd say some of the very smartest physicists and electromagnetic engineers I've ever met work in these projects. And they're in, usually most of the time, they're in a, a deep underground military. Building. I want to read this. In 1993, Bennett uh, proposed that a quantum state of particle could be trans, uh, transferred <laughs> to another distant particle mm -hmm. without moving to particles right. at all. This is called quantum state teleportation. There are many following theoretical and experimental papers published. Researchers believe that quantum teleportation is the foundation of quantum calculation and quantum communication. In 2008, mm -hmm. M. Hoda proposed that it may be possible to teleport energy by exploiting quantum energy fluctuations of an entangled, you said, mm -hmm. entangled vacuum state of mm -hmm. a quantum field. Mm -hmm. In 2023, zero temperature quantum energy transportation was observed and recorded by Kazuki Ikeda for the first time across microscopic distances mm -hmm. using IBM superconducting computers that are used by quantum computing. What? Mm -hmm. So it's already been done as being tested. Well, it has, but on this small level. I'm just saying that when you when you cross into these, let's call them these forbidden sciences right. that are, are been highly classified, I mean, you know, and they were standing on the shoulders of great people. Uh, Nikola Tesla discovered many of these this phenomenon. There were others. I mentioned the B. Phil Brown effect uh, with electrogravitic, so what's called electromagnetogravitic, where certain voltages cause objects to float uh, and shrink, change their structure, and I think it has more to do with the magnetic um, spin. I'm not a physicist, but from what I've studied and learned from people who worked on it, that it, that is what it's really doing. And, and it causes a magnetic field flux that alters uh, the mass, the actual, not weight, but mass of an object. And, and then it can float and go up, you know, put against gravity. And that's how also how you control. If you look at how these objects move, Often they've been, like we had one case when I was in uh, France uh, and we were uh, doing a what we call CE5 contact, which is when we, uh, when we attempt to make uh, contact with these uh, objects and these civilizations. And the object was moving uh, over us at uh, 200,000 uh, kilometers per hour. It was tracked by the French Ministry of Defense. And... An admiral was there. We were doing a demonstration for them. And it could make a right-hand turn or stop. Now, if you were in a normal vehicle, you're, if you were a pilot in a normal object, your brains would come out of your nose. The G-forces would kill you immediately. So we know that they're, they're able to do that and also control for 1G. In other words, so you're, you're really in an electromagnetic space-time bubble when you're moving like that. And, and that technology, as I mentioned, began to be experimented with in the 20s and 30s. But by the time the 40s came along and they started in earnest uh, st uh, studying the extraterrestrial vehicles, uh, it took a while. And also, it's not just energy and propulsion, it's specialized materials. Um, I have the CEO of a corporation that took, uh, was working on the, the skin of, of one of these, a part of the craft. And it was su such an unusual crystalline mat uh, metallic material. And they spent many years and figured out how to uh, fabricate it. So some of the really specialized materials we have that we use have been sort of two or three steps removed, r spun off from reverse engineering, studying extraterrestrial, not just energy and propulsion, but material science. So the material sciences are really interesting. And then the final one that's the big one is communication. Because the communication is, well, the, the Elon Musk would love this with Neuralink, but it's, it's uh, non-local. So their communication systems involve the ability to interface with very well-designed electromagnetic systems 
that interface with the consciousness field and thought. So in other words, you want to do something to your computer, you just think to it at, without a wire, without an implant. Like, I can like, see that. Mm -hmm. But think of it. I mean, a thought. what is thought? Um, you know, we have these thoughts and it's like, hey, what dreams may come. But, you know, it, you many people have had uh, these sort of experiences where they've had an out of body or near death. Uh, in my case, I, I met my wife in a series of lucid dreams. I think it's because I'm part Cherokee. Same here. Yep, I met her that way. I met her to at 18 years old. Yeah. And, well, we're going to have our 45th anniversary yeah. in a couple months. So what's interesting is that think about a civilization so advanced that that aspect of thought and consciousness without wiring, without something at the speed of electromagnetic, can interface with a device. So in 1991, I wrote a paper, and it was about this, and it was called Consciousness-Assisted Technologies, but it goes the other way, where a technology can assist your own consciousness. So you hear about the CIA remote viewing programs, like Ingo Swan, who was a friend of mine I knew, he, where they were able to use consciousness to spy on the Soviet Union or what have you, so-called psychic abilities. I mean, it's sort of a loaded term because it's so usually wacky, but that is real. And, and imagine a civilization so advanced that that innate ability is augmented, assisted with technological systems. And the reverse, that their, their uh, uh, technological systems can interface directly. So when you hear many accounts of these ETs, you'll see they'll, they'll touch a console and think to it and the craft moves. And goes. So this is not well, I'm Alexander a, Graham Bell using the speed of light electromagnetic. I think sometimes, you know, you're like, you're thinking about somebody and then boom, three seconds later, you get that phone call. Mm -hmm, sure. And that's happened, I don't know how many mm -hmm, times, sure. where it's happened, like, well, how did this happen? Right. What gave you the signal that that was coming? What gave you a signal that that was taking place? I, you know, I couldn't pinpoint on what that is. Oh, I do. But, but what is that? What it is. Yeah. Okay, this is why this is beautiful. This gets back into conscious quantum entanglement. So the ultimate non-local entangled field is the conscious mind itself. You know, Ernst Schrodinger, who was one of the fathers of quantum mechanics and particle wave theory in 1908, he said the total number of minds in the universe is one. And that is a singularity. So the real singularity they're looking for is actually the consciousness field. So you know, you and I are speaking right now, mm -hmm. and you have your individual self and, and, and ego and personality, and I have mine, mm -hmm. but we're both awake. And that awake field is a singularity. But we end up closing it off. So if you open this is what meditation does. Meditation enables you to connect to that deep or transcendent aspect of consciousness that's actually omnipresent, it's everywhere. It's not limited by space and time, which is why people can have experiences of a lucid dream and see something in the future or an intuition. And I, as a medical doctor, I mean, I'm not practicing now and the nurses knew I used to be able to do this. I would sense if someone had an occult or hidden cancer and I would just enigmatically order a CAT scan when it didn't seem to be indicated and it would be in there because I could sense it, see it. So that's something we ought to teach all doctors, by the way, but um, someday we will. But this is an area that gets into really controversial part of the work we do, and that is going beyond just sort of the material entanglement to, uh, you know, how are these civilizations communicating? Well, it can't be like our cell phone at the speed of light. And it's got to be something that is instantaneous. Well, it turns out through the consciousness field and thought, you actually can connect, bang, instantly across a million light years of space, which is really amazing to think about. Yes, it's a, a way um, mind, thoughts, mm -hmm. teleport. I don't know if you want to use that word. Mm -hmm. Could physical things teleport? Could you? Yes. You know, at you know, at one point, one would say, "How am I going to be able to email you to go from here to Australia within half a second? How does that happen, right? Mm -hmm. What causes that yeah. to happen, right? M you know, uh, some of the stuff is way too advanced for the average person to be thinking about. This is why you know, specific topics like this, we're having this conversation with you. But let me go to the next topic here. So ESG, right? Environmental, social governance. Mm -hmm. 
so important that even this net zero, you know, uh, 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 asset managers initiative, I don't know if you're familiar with it or not, they're talking about more than 315 signatories with the U.S. Uh, dollar, $57 trillion in assets under management. You know, the Net Zero Asset Managers Initiative is an international group of asset managers committed consistent with their fiduciary duty, duty to their clients and beneficiaries to supporting the goal of net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 or sooner in line with the global efforts to limit warning to one and a half degrees Celsius. Right. And to supporting uh, investing aligned with net zero emission by 2050 or sooner. Are these guys noble people or are they full of shit? Well, to be honest with you, I think many of them are well-meaning but uninformed. In other words, you're not going to – I own the – I have the largest legal allowable solar farm in Virginia at my farm because the state caps how big it can be. And when our power went out in a snowstorm, we had no heat. We had nothing. It barely – I mean, this is a joke. You're not going to run a planet with 8 billion people with solar and wind. Now, with these zero-point quantum vacuum, these sort of technologies that have been confiscated, patents have been confiscated, what we've been talking about, that would get us there very quickly. But so I think their aspirations may be, in fact, noble, but their methodology is is fatally flawed because they're not going to get there with any of the schemes that they're planning now. And that's the, the frustration here. Now, ironically, I was at a meeting in 2013 off the coast of Australia, it was a group of world muckety mucks. It was I was asked to give a keynote at this thing. Um, I think it was 120 people flown in on this island, and one of the people there was the head of uh, international. I think it was international Greenpeace director. He was so hostile to what I was saying because I pointed out that the only way we're going to get to these solutions to clean up the oceans and the air and all this and it, it is to bring out these technologies. And he wouldn't hear of anything except the orthodoxy of wind and solar. And I said, but, you know, have you actually run the numbers on that? You can't get there from here. Uh, with 8 billion people, you know, there's not enough energy density in either, or reliability in wind and solar. Plus, wind doesn't blow all the time and the sun isn't up all the time. And the battery storage needs are... Uh, ludicrously huge. We have no ability to do that. So the solutions are going to have to come from the high-tech classified sector. Good news to all your children and mine is that we have the solution. The bad news is a bunch of Nazis, and I use that word like petro-Nazi, true fascist, ruthless people are keeping it secret. And I'll just put it on the table. And you're not going to get there by wishful thinking and, and uh, holding hands and singing kumbaya. You're going to have to do the heavy lift of getting these uh, declassified. Now, here's another solution. I've made an appeal, if there are people of high net worth, to put together uh, a venture capital fund that would uh, be an angel fund to create an open source R&D lab on this kind of uh, electromagnetic and physics. And I think with the information that we have, that probably in a, a couple of years, we would come out without the government declassifying anything, since most of the government doesn't have access, or these big corporations releasing it, we could bring it out. And if you open sourced it in a multi-centered way, streamed it on the internet, the whole lab streamed, the instant you got your eureka moment, Everyone who's an engineer or physicist would have the solution. There'd be no patent. There'd be no intellectual property restriction. That's what I've been proposing that we do. And honestly, if you're actually wanting to spend a fraction, you know, a millionth of a percent of what they're going to spend on this scheme, you'd get to this solution probably in, in a couple of years. A question for you. What do you think about Terrence Howard? Did you watch the podcast with him and Joe Rogan? I did not. You did not. Mm. So you don't see what things he was talking about. No, I didn't. It was a very viral interview. Are you familiar with Billy Carson? Oh yeah, I know him very. Well. What, what are you? What are your thoughts on Billy Carson? Oh yeah, I think he's doing some good work. He's here locally, and and you know, I, I, last year I got the Disclosure for Humanity Award from his organization. Right, we had him on two days ago. I thought it was very interesting. Mm -hmm. Listen to him. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Would you guys? You, would you say you guys are very similar on some of the uh, ideas and beliefs, or where, where do you? 
Well, I, th- I don't know because I didn't see that interview. And honestly, this sounds terrible. I don't have time to, to I don't look at other things much. And it's, it's in the, I just am overwhelmed. <laughs> I mean, you know, you take a, like, unpack a little bit of what I tell you we're doing. I'm, I've, you know, with this huge family and flying all over the world and working with all these covert things. I, I, I'm not sitting and looking at these things. I, I wish I could tell you. I had, no, I, so I, I appreciate that. I, I, pl- I plead my ignorance, and, and it's not to dismiss anyone. It's just I, I don't have time. I, I want to wrap up on this. I think one of the things you said um, when I was watching, you know, the, the lost century, mm-hmm. right? And at the end, you said you wanted to build a facility that's going to be open source 24-7. You're working on stuff and there's cameras for other people to see on whatever you're building, right? This whole mm-hmm. concept of open source right. probably became more mainstream when Elon started talking about all our stuff is open source. Open, open source is a phrase that's been around for a long time, but right. he just kind of took it to a whole different level with mm-hmm. you know, a few hundred million followers. I'm like, oh, what is open source? Let me look into this. Mm-hmm. So walk, walk me through why you know, your idea of open source and how that would protect both everyone, why that's a good idea, you know, is, is it going to get others to look and see, well, what if we can do it better? What if we can do it better? What are your thoughts on that? Well, see, that's the beauty of, of like crowdsourcing information. So let's say you're working on a system and you get stuck because you're having a problem rectifying the electromagnetic frequencies or whatever. If it's open source and it's streamed, you have scientists all over the world there would be a specialist in there that could pipe in and say, well, try this, right? So you collapse time frames. Secondly, and this is more important, if you do it secretively, the minute you get that eureka moment, the door is going to get kicked in, the device is going to get confiscated, and you're going to get a national security order on it, or, or you may get killed. Whereas if it's being streamed and the, uh, the old saying, the whole world's watching, that can't happen. And the other is that it can't be black shelled. If a corporation does it, um, I know people who become very wealthy by having an invention like that, and they say, "Well, hey, you know, what's your price? Here's fifty million dollars. Go buy a Lamborghini," and you know they sold the, and they, they sold, sold and and that corporation puts it on a black shelf, right? And it never is seen or the patent office. In our archive, you'll see an interview. Shell did it, right? Shell bought one of the guys for $25 million, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, it happens all the time. Right. I've been, you know, since 1991, I've been dealing with inventors that keep having that happen. The other is that if you go the patent route, uh, there is a provision in the patent laws related to this secrecy act you talked about. And if you look at the interview we had with Dr. Uh, Paul Vallone, who is a physicist who was in the patent office, he blew the whistle that they were doing this. And that we have that. We have that interview with him. Um, he s- ended up suing the patent office because he was terminated and fired and, and, and won a settlement, so he won't talk about it now. You said Valone, Paul Valone? Yeah. How do you spell Valone? V-A-L-L-O-N-E. Got it. And Dr. Paul Valone. Yeah. He's a, a PhD physicist. So, um, yeah, we have all that information. So what I've tried to do is say, over the last 100 years, how has this gone sideways when people have got these discoveries? And so the idea of doing this on live on the internet, streamed, uh, backed up, multi-centered, but also where there's no intellectual property or patent attached to it. It's, you, 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 basically, you're squeezing the toothpaste out of the tube so fast no one can put it back in. Um, and, and that I don't th- think would be so easily frustrated as, say, someone doing a stand-up, uh, you know, a startup company, and they're doing it secretively, and it's like the next iPhone, we're going to keep it under wraps. You know, that's how you end up dead or getting confiscated. And one of the things that, I, that w- I've found is people don't learn from history. Like, if you study this history of these sort of incredible in te- technologies and inventions, you'll see a certain number of patterns. And one of them is, is this, that people who try to do it even with the best intentions, but are trying to, pro, you know, monetize it at the front end and keep it a secret or a patent or a special sauce. It never gets out to the public, and they never end up getting anything for it unless they take a bribe. Who was the guy you spoke to, the fellow where you said, look, I'm telling you, make it open source, leak it to everybody. No, 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 I'm not going to do it. I'm pretending. Then, boom, he was killed. Who was the guy? You talked about somebody on uh, oh, yeah. The Lost Century. Yeah, well, I, I'm not sure in that film. There were several people that have had that happen. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's a tragedy. 
Was it um, Thomas Moray or no, not Moray? It was one of the ones you no, had a conversation I, I with. I had to look at the, Yeah, there, you know, I've dealt with hundreds of these inventors over the years. Who and, don't want to give it up, who don't want to make it uh, They source. make the same mistake over and over and over and over. Well, actually, one of the groups was, you know, the guys who bought all the Stan Meyer. You know, he had a car that was running on uh, uh, water. And that was real mm -hmm. uh, back in the mm -hmm. 90s, I believe. And uh, but he also what everyone didn't know he had a toroidal, a donut shaped electromagnetic device. Yep, and you'll see a picture of this thing because we were going to try to get that collection because he had died. Everyone thinks he was poisoned. We, we don't know, but he dropped dead suddenly. And but there was a group that had a lot of funding from an offshore source who I know now. But we didn't know who they were, and they were they got all that material, and they were studying it, basically reverse engineering Stan Meyer's inventions, including this electromagnetic, it was like a donut-shaped object that was free energy. And it had a national security order on it from way back then, I think in the, from the 80s. And when they got it operational, they were sabotaged. They were death threats. So I got a call from their big funder, Lord So and So. I'm not going to say it on the air because I kept this confidential. Who was providing all the money? And I said, Well, I told them, if you do this secretly, when you hit that eureka moment, it works. You're going to run into the mother of all buzz saws. And they did. And he says, Well, what should I do? I said, you need to have them open source this, dump it on the internet immediately into me, and I'll see that it gets to millions of people. They wouldn't do it. They still thought they could keep it secret. They were going to go to another country. I said, dude, you're going to have to go to another damn planet, <laughs> right, to, to, to protect yourself. So and the next thing I heard, I think it was more than a dozen of them were killed. And all that tech, everything vanished. And that wasn't that long ago. That was just a few years ago. And... You know, I've seen this happen too often. So everyone who gets dollar signs in their eyes, I'm going to be the next Rockefeller of energy. Yeah, well, here's what's going to happen. Before that occurs, Murder Incorporated is going to kick your door in and kick your ass. Or, you know, you'll, they'll offer to buy you out. But you're not going to benefit humanity or the earth. I, I think it's sort of like when um, the, the DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Project Administration, started the Internet. It was them, not Al Gore. And Al Gore claimed he invented it. I know. It is yeah. funny. But, but the truth is, DARPA, it, 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 you know, it's open source, and it, it, it spun off thousands of companies, including some that are trillion-dollar companies. I think that if a group did this as angel funders, they would be able to, to, to get it out there, and it would spawn a whole new economy. Imagine what could happen in Africa and South America and India, impoverished areas. Um, you would have uh, such a, a huge uplift in humanity and the economy. Now, as that goes up, there are going to be some people who will go the other way, just like royal typewriters didn't adapt to the Internet age and computers, and so they went the way of all flesh. If you made... Uh, horse carriages and you didn't adapt to the automobile, you went bankrupt. So, you know, at a certain point, that's just the way technology has to evolve. So the secrecy around all this, it's, it's time for it to end. And that's how it's going to happen. It isn't going to happen. Open anymore. source model. So you have to, you have to be willing to do it for civilization and your kids and family and others instead of your pocketbook. Yeah, but on the second order, now let's remember, if you did it open source, it doesn't mean you can't then productize it, create products secondarily. Now, there'll be a lot of people doing that, but it's like the first Xerox machine was the, still the first Xerox machine, even if it eventually got copied and imitated. And, and let's not forget, in this climate globally, I don't care if you patent it or keep it secret. The first thing that's going to happen is in China and other countries, they're going to study it, reverse engineer it, yeah. come out with generation two. And they're not going to care about your patent or your intellectual property. Or even in America, that we just saw what even happened in with the FTC non-compete laws. Yes. They just changed right now. That's getting effect in, right. in, in August that they're doing that. Right. Um, okay. That, that's just a given. Yeah. So I tell people about this, you need to be smart about it. Because if you don't learn 
from history, you're going to repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. And that's, as I say, it's you know, the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different result. So I think this, this is a fresh approach. It's controversial because most people I've met of high net worth, they want to keep it secret. They want to monetize it. They, you know, it's like, you're like, dude, you've already got a billion. Do you care? I mean, you know, at a certain point, I mean, I'm a retired doctor. I, I, I'm comfortable, but, you know, I can't fund something like that. But I'm always astonished at how myopic uh, a lot of folks are about this. Have you ever had a meeting with uh, Elon Musk or no? Have you guys ever, ever had a conversation? No, no, I haven't. Okay. Yeah, I don't know him personally. Interesting. Yeah. I have a friend who... who uh, who does, but have you, you've never been on Tucker? You guys have never had any conversations? No, um, I, I think he reached out. It just hasn't happened. I'd love to. Yeah. You know, yeah. No, well, hook us up. I, I mean, I think he, uh, he's, he's been on the right path on some things on this issue. And, and then I think he got gaslit and diverted. I mean, I'll be honest with you. Yeah. Um, I think he's, he's, um, he, his level of curiosity mm-hmm. and willingness to, um, seek the truth right. and challenge the status quo and have the mm-hmm. I don't give a yes. you know yeah. attitude is yeah. is yeah. gonna both get him in trouble as well as get us closer to the truth. Yes. And I think that's a very uh, uh, honorable position to be in, risky, yep. uh, because you risk not being liked and hated and, you know, defame and defamation, all this other oh, stuff sure. that comes with it. But hey, I've I've, I've had it. But here, but yeah. the other thing is I said this earlier, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing with this issue because I think out in the public, there's nine parts disinformation and fake stuff and one, maybe one part real. And so, I mean, the reason the the chief folks for the Senate Intelligence Committee have asked me to come in is because they know that I actually have information. And so I think journalists uh, like Mr. Uh, Carlson or others need to, if they're really going to look into this, need to look into it properly and avail themselves of experts. And I always tell people, not me so much as what's what we've collected, but I can articulate that. But I just think it's very important for people to understand this is not like anything else. If you take for the, 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 the top secret document from Canada from 1950, one of the things that said, black and white, this issue is the most secret subject in the entire U.S. government exceeding the secrecy of the detonation of the first hydrogen bomb when they were working on the hydrogen bomb. That was 1950, 52, we detonated it. Imagine anything more secret than the ultimate doomsday weapon and what kind of counterintelligence and disinformation has been pushed out to the public to gaslight people and divert them. So I think people have to take that document seriously and say, well, what has been done? Yeah. And that's been my huge challenge is to, you know, sift the truth from the fiction to the best I can. Rob, let's put the link below on chat when it goes live on Spotify, on Apple. Can you say the domain? So even some of the people that just listened to the audio, they know how to go find it. If you can give the domain, if you really, if you want to find it, go to drstephengreer.com. And, and from be there a you link. can go yeah, to it. Okay, yeah. fantastic. So that's the easy way to go to and it. And also, I, just a little appeal. Um, two things. Um, next, in July, we're going to uh, have a gathering in California in Temecula. Uh, that if people want a webinar with that, they're going to learn a whole lot more about all this, including the CE5 contact. And there's an app for CE5 contact you can get. We're also crowdfunding the archive because it's going to cost us six digits a year and the only way we're going to keep it free we don't have a paywall up we're keeping it free but the only way to keep it free is that people contribute so we're asking for people where do they do on your website or on yes okay it says donate right there at the top yes see it fantastic um last time we did it was four years ago yeah okay I'm hoping the next time we do it, it's not four years from now. Yeah, let's do that. I I agree. I I really enjoyed it. I appreciate you. Appreciate your work. Um, I'd never heard about Invention Secrecy Act until I watched your documentary. And I'm so curious about it. I want to know what's behind it. There's a high level of curiosity. And I highly recommend everybody, if you don't go to his website, go watch the documentary, Mm. The Lost Century. And you'll see what it's going to do to you when you start thinking about some of these clips. This is a podcast. This documentary actually shows these people that had the inventions and what happened to their lives. I think it's very, very important for everybody around the world to watch this. Dr. Stephen Greer, thank you so much for coming out. This was fantastic. I appreciate it. I appreciate you. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.